Yeah, Bullet, Bustle of Trace, Winville, Bustles. What's this one? Hello, and welcome to Jason Cavanagh's Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cavanagh. Today at Kevin's HR, we launch our refund campaign. Go to https semicolon backslash backslash refunder.com slash Kevin's HR to learn more. Our guest today is Dirk Van Velsen. Dirk, here to be great today. I think so. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So, Dirk, what's um something you do for fun? I started racing motorcycles. Okay. Pretty recently? Yeah, the last maybe two months. Okay. Now I use the word race really loosely. <laughs> <laughs> I go in circles around around a track and I'm just learning. So I've been riding since I was probably 15 or 14 officially, but I've never actually gone to a track. So what what kind of bike do you have? I have a CBR 1000 RR that I bought from my buddy. And I just recently bought a brand new, uh, was well, a 2021 model, but a brand new for me. And it had 0 0.3 miles on it when I got it. Did you say 0 0.3? Yeah, it was a showroom model. How's so that even possible? 0 0.3? Just a showroom model is just sitting on the showroom. And that was an Aprilia, uh, Italian model. I see you have an Italian flag on you someplace. Yeah. yeah. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so what's, is that, what's your, like your dream motorcycle? Like cost was no limit and like speed was no limit, you know? Have, just get it where you want to. I've always loved the Ducatis. Okay. And I almost got one this time, but I couldn't afford a new one, which is like the one I'd want is the one I could reasonably afford is like 40 grand. Mm -hmm. The one I really want is like 120 grand. Mm -hmm. So I'm not at that level. So if I got the $40,000 one, I'd have to get a used one to drop it down to maybe the 20s. But there's a risk getting used Ducatis from people. Yeah. So I didn't do that. When I, I was in the Army, I was in for two years. A one with like a motorcycle person, I all bought back Ducatis, right? Yep. Yeah, they're they're really they're beautiful, they're sexy. I heard that's kind of like a maintenance they, trouble. I think that they had a lot of history in the past. Mm -hmm. I think they're better now, but better. <laughs> yes, that's what level. Yeah, exactly. It's not a Honda. Yeah. So next, talk about you being a mountain athlete. Yeah, I used to. Uh, I haven't done it in a while because COVID hit, and I just kind of started doing other things. But I used to do those Spartan races, and that would kind of counted as some mountain stuff. And if people don't know what those are, is those obstacle course races where you just pretend like you're in boot camp. <laughs> you you do a bunch of running, you uh -huh. go to different obstacles. So there was that. Uh, I do mountain biking in the mountains, skiing, uh, hiking, climbing, things like that. What's the worst you walked out on a mountain bike? Probably just recently. <laughs> it's like when I was younger, I didn't wipe out so bad. Um, but maybe a year ago, I was... I borrowed my friend's electric mountain bike. So I went all the way up to, I think it was Tiger Mountain. And you know, you're just passing everyone on the way up because you because it's, it's powered. And on the way down, it's kind of a big heavy machine. And I just got going too fast. I hit a route and I flew off. But luckily I had a helmet on. And normally I'm not a helmet person, but this time I had one. So I, I cracked my head pretty good. And uh <laughs> you know, you know, I, I'm almost I'm 50 now, so I think I was doing that when I was 49. And uh Bang myself up pretty good, but uh, that was pretty much the worst. Yeah. So on your LinkedIn profile, it says that you're a world changer. What is a world changer in your point of view? Oh, that's uh, anything you can do to, you know, make the world a different place, presumably better. And I guess that probably ties into my nonprofit. You know, we, we help currently and formerly incarcerated people change their lives. And when you change the life of a person, that has a ripple effects through society. And how about being a people collector? That is the people collector part has to do with, I'm not good at a lot of things. So the best way to get good at something or maybe make a project happen is to gather people that are good at something. Are, are we good at your? Yeah, no, we're good. Okay. Yeah. So that just means, you know, finding people that are at the top of their field or good at whatever they do and you just gather them together. And I think, I think I can't remember what CEO said it, but, uh, it was about managing people. And he said, well, I just hire the best people I can. I just get out of their way. And that's but kind of the rate. Isn't it amazing how many people say that, but don't do it right? That's, that's yeah. Cause part of also that gets you to the, the role that you're in is you're, you want it to be perfect and you're kind of a micromanager. So it's hard to detach from the, that part of it and give people autonomy. Yeah. And uh, so you live here in the Seattle area. I used to live in Ballard. Oh, Ballard. Okay. And then I, I fled 
to uh, Lakewood, which is down by Tacoma. Oh, that's I remember. Yeah, down about yeah. Uh, right when COVID hit. So you drove up here, took the bus, or how you get up? You drove, you yeah, get parked, you drove, yeah. I was going to ride the motorcycle, but I was kind of nervous leaving on the street for two or three hours. Yeah. There's a guy, I have no idea he is, but every day he parks like, it's not like, it's like a, it looks like a dirt bike. I'm sure it's not a dirt bike, but it's like parks out front a lot of times. He'll be there all day long. Kind of like one of those enduro ones? Yeah. 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 Just like that, yeah. yeah. So I think the biggest risk of the motorcycle is if I don't crash it, they get stolen because yeah. they're pretty, you know, they're good looking. Yeah, and I, I, more, I always wonder like how much come more more so get stolen, right? Because like you just have to, I mean, of course, at that light, you probably have two or three men, but you just pick it up and take it, right? Or is like, I mean, I guess you hotwire something, right? Yeah, I think there's all sorts of ways. And, you know, in my criminal history, I've never been a motorcycle thief, so I don't really know yeah. the ins and outs. But I was told that uh, in addition to like, you know, just breaking the lock and and somehow hot wiring it, I guess. Um, the other way is they, they'll just pull up. And here's, here's a horror story I heard. So just to back the story up a little bit, in 2018, I rode my Triumph to Cabo and back. And then as I was contemplating my ride in Mexico, I was warned that the motorcycle thefts in Mexico were even crazier than they are up here. So like if your motorcycle's on the street, to kind of answer your question, how they get stolen, like a truck will pull up, a couple of guys will jump out, stick two by fours between the spokes of the wheels and just pick it up, throw in the back of the pickup truck, and then there you go. So no matter what alarms or locking mechanisms you have on your motorcycle, unless it's like chained to a street light, yeah, they're just throwing in the back of the pickup truck. I just wonder, like, you really don't hear much like motorcycle thefts on the news stuff. You always hear about car thefts, and like, I think right now they're saying Kia and another car is like really stealable, so to speak. Yeah, because the Kia's had that like some kind of deal with the USB driver. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that was all about. Yeah, but I'm in I'm in a couple of motorcycle groups, and probably every. Every two or three days, somebody will post a picture of their motorcycle. Hey, my R1 just got stolen. Let me know if you see it. So I, I'm kind of like hyper aware that they're mm -hmm. getting stolen. And I don't, want, I don't want to have to be posting a picture of my ape. <laughs> yeah. Real fast, can you talk about the unlocked vent futures? Yeah, that was... Um, so since, you know, I'm, since I'm in the criminal justice reform space, that was a partnership with New Profit and John Legend. And it's kind of like an accelerator program for people that started nonprofits that had done time in prison, which is me. And uh, they give us 50 grand. They give us a bunch of coaching. Is it, I'm guessing it's pretty competitive. You get accepted to it. Yeah, there's an application process. And I don't know how many people applied that didn't get in. But, you know, they pick and choose, I'm sure. Um, and I think at first I didn't get in, but then I had somebody lobby for me on the inside to help me get so I got, I got past the hurdle. I got in in the partnership with John Legend is super cool because John Legend is pretty amazing. And then they make this little video of you. And so I have my own little highly produced John Legend video. I mean, he's not in it, but I'm in it just, you know, talking about what we do. And they partner with a company called Proper Daily. And they're like an L.A. production firm that does marketing and stuff. So they had like, you know, I'd, I'd be walking through New York, New York. The streets of New York, and there'd be like six different cameras around me, and all the the lighting stuff, kind of like, yeah. kind of like what you have. How long was that program? I think it's about a year. A year, okay. Yeah, and then I, I think they've been doing it every year. I was in the very first one, the inaugural cohort. Um, I think they stopped one year when COVID hit, and now they're back rolling. And so, what did you gain out of the program? Uh, leadership skills, mentorship, um, coaching. You know, of course, I think there's probably about. 12 or 15 people in my cohort. So you you know, learn alongside, you know, formerly incarcerated people that start started really cool. And it was in person somewhere? Yeah. It was in we, they flew us out to Boston, New York. Um so people from all the United States and okay. Yeah, exactly. Um so the people there are like, you know, I don't know the correct term, but like former like jail people, so to speak. Yeah, formerly incarcerated. And yeah. was they all like kind of the same crimes or like, you know, like was they like, you know, like low level crimes or like all the same type? Oh, all sorts of all sorts of okay. all sorts of different things. Probably the, the the most amazing person I met in there was uh well, first I'll tell you what he his organization that he started, and then I'll tell you his backstory, which is probably incongruent. So he started an organization to help sex offenders transition back to society because you know. All formerly incarcerated people, they face all these these burdens and these these things that trail after your conviction. <clears throat> I think Berkeley did a study, and there's like 41,000 collateral consequences. Like once your prison sentence is done, so, you know a lot of people say, "Hey, just do your time and just move on." 
well, there, there really isn't much moving on because everything from housing to, to jobs, to employment, um, all these things are impacted by your criminal record. And usually you don't go back to your same neighborhood where you commit a crime at anyway. So there's no fresh start. You go back to your whole crew. They're doing the same thing. And like, you try, well, I don't do the right thing. They're like, well, you've been unemployed for four months. You know, here's some drug money. Go yep. burn drugs. I know where the case may be again, right? In fact, I, one of my... Uh, one of my friends inside of prison was exactly like that. We, we had that conversation before he got out because we were talking about what he was going to do when he released. And he was worried about going back to the same neighborhood and all that stuff. And he was a kid from, you know, like the slums of Everett. <laughs> it's just white trash, you know, drug, meth, all that stuff. And sure enough, he got out, reoffended, came back. And even though he knew that was what was going to happen, I mean, it was inevitable. It happened anyways. And I'm running a bet like that kid would have said, well, I make this up maybe, but probably see what I had, had a family go say in Denver, Colorado, probably all off, you know, really take care of him. If you would ask that family, can I come live with you? They would probably say no, right? Because we don't want this guy come in. He's a criminal, right? You know, I think a lot of this problem could be fixed if more families do what they're supposed to do. But yeah. it's just, just my opinion. Yeah, I think it's actually completely opposite. He was like, instead of like generational wealth, he had like generational poverty in, in Everett. So he didn't have a great support mechanism. I think he was living with his grandma and you know, his parents were where they went. Um, so he didn't really have any great guidance. Um, and he knew, he knew it was a bad situation. And, and my argument is, if you know the drug dealers are outside your house, and you're just doing your stuff inside your house, can't you just walk past them and just do your own thing? But you know, social mechanisms and yeah, peer pressure, peer pressure is real, right? Yeah, it's real. It's real. So yeah, so that goes all the way back to this one guy who started this organization. For helping sex offenders transition and it just really you know i'm not a big fan i mean it's an emotional subject sex offenders like i don't think anyone's a big fan of <laughs> people that play with kids and i'm not either so this guy since he started this organization i was really curious what his history was like you know why are you so sympathetic to sex offenders apparently for his story he was sexually uh, abused when he was a kid him and his brother and then when they were maybe 14 or 15 like middle-aged teenagers they ended up killing the guy that molested them. So what you think is a pretty righteous thing to do, you know, and however you want to look at it. Um, but then he did like, I think, 20 years in prison for killing the abuser, as maybe I don't think he really needed 20 years for that crime. Um, but then he got out and his his heart is different than he has a different soul, I guess. Like he actually reached out to help those people that abuse him, which is really amazing. Yeah, sometimes you have to wonder about our criminal justice system because like, I, remember the ones, I remember the details, but this young lady, like 14, I think 16, 17, right, was being abused by this guy, like, I mean, really badly abused. And one day she killed him, right? And they put her in jail like 20 years, 20 years since. And I was, like, yeah. big, I was like, what? I mean, a lot of people say, like, give them a reward. Yeah. <laughs> and they, they solve the problem. Or, or at least, like, maybe, okay, the law says you're on 20-year sentence. Give them the 20-year sentence, but then suspend it, you know, or... Yeah. Or, I or mean... 20-year sentence, but in-house arrest or something, right? I think in the, in the eyes of the law, is like, you broke a, you broke the law, the laws are on the books, you can't kill people, even if you have a good reason, you know? Yeah. That's to make you wonder sometimes. Definitely. So, so you were in jail for 15 years. Yeah. Was it like a 15 straight year sentence? You had reduced time or like the 15 oh, it, years seems like a long time. For, I think we're doing burglaries, right? Yeah, it was more like 25 years. Okay. And then, of course, I got out after 15 with good time and all that stuff. But I was, I was pretty busy. So I know when you first went to jail, you talk about, you know, you did the typical criminal life, like, you know, prison life, you know, push ups, eating right. But then something in your brain switched, like, this ain't the life for me, right? I, I could do something different. Can you talk about that? Yeah. I, I, actually, I think that started right away. So, um, when I was in county jail and I was looking at this long prison sentence, um, it's really hard to get your head around. If you really try to think about it, you're going to live in like a concrete box the size of a parking space <laughs> for 15 years. Like, how are you going to do that? Um, and I was, I think I fell when I was maybe 28. So I was still pretty young and trying to like get my head around this thing. Like, holy smokes, I'm, I'm do doing a lot of time. How is this going to play out? I'm like, well, I'll just... I'll keep myself busy with maybe I'll go to school because, you know, college education had always been strong in my family, like the idea of it. But I was, you know, immature. I didn't have a delayed gratification. So I, I tried college, but I flunked out miserably. Um, so I never really did the college thing. And instead, I became a criminal. <laughs> so when I actually got to prison, I figured, well, 
what a great opportunity to take some of this time that I have widely available to me and maybe go to school. And then when I was in the county jail, the guards were talking about you could do college programs when you got to prison. And this is in 1998. Yeah, 98. So when I, it took me a couple of years to get through the county jail. When I finally got to prison in 2000, I was like, great, I'm here. I'm going to take some, I'm going to get the Pell Grant, get some college classes under my belt and, and away I go. And for the listeners that don't know, the Pell Grant is, is federal student aid for anyone that's poor. So if you make a certain amount of, or if you don't make a certain amount of money, you get free federal aid. Um, and of course, if you're in prison with no income, you qualify. Well, as it turned out, the Pell Grant was taken away from prisoners in 1994 during the tough on crime uh, war on drug days. The idea back then was they were hoping to dissuade criminals from committing crimes by taking away opportunities in prison. Like they're going to make prison so terrible that you're not going to want to go there. But the assumption there is that people are doing a cost benefit analysis before they do their crimes. <laughs> but it, the irony is like if you want to reduce crime, you actually increase educational opportunities. You don't decrease them. So of course, what they did is they stripped away the Pell Grants for all prisoners in America in 94. And I think there's about 357 college prison programs. And then when they took away the Pell Grant, that dropped to eight. So of course, when I get to prison in 2000, the guards didn't know the Pell Grant was taken away because they were just in the county jail. And of course, I get to prison. I was like, okay, where are these great educational programs I heard about? They're like, oh no, <laughs> those don't exist anymore. So... So in prison, what are some like, of course, the, you, you watch TV, there's a, the, the myth of being in prison, right? You know, all the gang fighting, the violence, you know, all that kind of stuff. How much is that really true? Like, how much is this fantasy? How much, like, I have to imagine, like, there's a bunch of, I have to imagine a bunch of boredom, right? Like, 99% boredom, more percent terror with, like, something like tr trying to do something bad to you. Uh, well, I started off my time in California. In California, um, so I should probably add some context here too. So I was a commercial burglar. So in Washington, that means I'm breaking like Fusion Shop, Comp USA, golf club businesses, like stealing truckloads worth of stuff. And you just like go pawn it or something or like? Yeah, I, I either had a fence ahead of time or I would just go find a fence. So and was that like, was that like profitable to you? Like, so to speak, like if you, you know, of course, I'm sure you knew, like you said, a cost benefit analysis, but like. <laughs> Yeah, it had to be worthwhile that you were in town and had to be make enough money to like, do that stuff, I would think. Yeah, I hate to like, you know, this probably isn't the show to say how great crime was, but I, I, had, a, I had a good time. Mm -hmm. I have a kind like with, I mentioned the motorcycle, so I have kind of a, an adrenaline, you know, like I don't have a drug addiction, but maybe adrenaline is. Um, so I probably enjoyed the work because it was kind of risky and scary. And um, when you steal a truckload with the golf clubs, you make a lot of money. So that was great. Of course, then you get caught, and then you're looking at 25 years in prison. And eventually, everyone gets caught. You yeah, right. So that's not great. So like, and if I took that same energy and just did something legal with my time in my 20s, that probably would have been better. <laughs> because once you look at the whole picture, okay, mm -hmm. I had a couple of years of fun in the 20s, making money selling stolen goods. Then 15 years in prison, that wasn't great. <laughs> so maybe just uh, do it, do it the right way the first time. Yeah. So back to the the prison story. Yeah. So. So yeah, prison. Oh yeah. So I was a commercial burglar in Washington and then my partner, long story short, he got caught and then I fled to California. Actually, I fled to Arizona because they didn't have the helmet law. So I took my, C I, I took my CBR, put in a U-Haul trailer and drove to Arizona so I could ride my motorcycle without a helmet. <laughs> you know, the wind going through my hair and all that stuff. Um, when I was living in Arizona, then I went over to California a couple of times, made some friends over there met my future ex-girlfriend and um, I lived with her. Then when I was living in Santa Barbara, being a burglar, <laughs> I broke in the sheriff's department armory and I stole all their guns. Um, so even though it was a, a burglary. So you're either a very good burglar or a very bold burglar or a very dumb burglar. <laughs> right there. All, all three at the same time. <laughs> so um, what, what was happening was I was doing a lot of shooting because I, I like to shoot and ammo was expensive. So I mentioned I've been it, make, it makes sense. That makes sense now. <laughs> yeah. And, and like I mentioned, I, I was a mountain athlete. So what I was doing, I was driving through the hills of Santa Barbara looking for some places to hike. And I stumbled upon this, this firing range. And it had these, these big ammo lockers next to it. And they had this building. And I kind of figured out, oh shit, that's the that's the sheriff's department training facility. I was like, great. <laughs> I'm a burglar. I know how to do this. <laughs> so we went back a couple of nights later. 
I, I, I intended just to steal all their ammo. Of course, once I was there, opportunity yeah. arose and I stole all their guns. I bet when they saw, they're like, what idiot did this? <laughs> oh, they were hot because apparently a couple months before I broke into their armory, there was like a major jailbreak, like a couple guys escaped from jail. So they spent like a couple million dollars securing the the sheriff's department compound, like including the jail, the training facility, like all that. The place, basically the place I broke into just had an upgrade in security. And then here comes Dirk, you know, a couple months later. Do, do, Easy do, do. peasy. <laughs> and I got to tell you, it's actually one of the easiest burglaries I ever did. Yeah. Because the cops are arrogant. You know, like yeah. nobody would steal from us. We're the yeah. cops. Yeah. Well, not so much. You saw a target opportunity, <laughs> you took it. Yeah. So the story there is, even though I broke in the sheriff's department training facility, stole all their guns, it's still classified as a residential, I mean, a commercial burglary, meaning it's an unoccupied building and you're stealing stuff. So it's not like, I'm not breaking somebody's house. I'm, I'm not trying to, first, I'm not trying to justify my crimes, but like, it's, there's a difference between a residential burglary. I mean, you did do a risk analysis if you think about it. A little bit. Yeah. It's like, well, in two different ways. One, I didn't want to break into somebody's house because what if they're there? Yeah. What if they're there? That's a potential for and what they have, they're in, they have guns. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, a, that's a true part. And the other thing is I wanted to get a lot of stuff. I didn't want to like, I didn't want somebody's used VCR mm -hmm. or their old mountain bike. Yeah. It's like, I don't want somebody's used crap. Mm -hmm. And not only did I want, not want that equipment, I don't want to steal from people. Like that's his stuff. Mm -hmm. And I, I would justify it to myself, like if I broke into Comp USA. That's Comp it, USA stuff. It's their stuff. Like the manager has to file a report in the morning. It's insured. You're like, yeah, that's part of this text right off of the business, you know. Yeah. Or so I mean, I know that when I do that, the impact is that company has to raise, you know, the insurance has to raise their rates. The company has to sell the product for more. So they're spreading the loss over more people, and it's still creating damage to society. So it's not really a good justification to say, well, it's insured. It's, yeah. Nobody pays. Well, we all pay. The difference is we're all paying versus if you break into somebody's house, then he feels violated. He's like, oh, my God, somebody just broke into my house. I don't feel safe here. He, they stole my favorite sword or, or, or whatever it is. Um, and that actually, actually happened with the armory because I stole the, the sheriff's personal uh, Thompson machi machine gun. And when they finally caught me, the, the first thing they asked me was, do you still have the Tommy gun? Because <laughs> <laughs> it was like a 1917 issue Tommy gun, two drum clips, a couple stick clips. And those go for like 30 grand. Oh, wow. So the only thing the sheriff wanted to know was where's the Tommy gun. And I still had it. Yeah. So he got that back. Oh, yeah. So back back to that whole crime. Even though it sounds scary, I'm breaking the armory, stealing other guns. And granted, that is scary because they're they're coming to come shooting for you when they find out. Um, it's still a commercial burglary, just like breaking into an old record shop. So I that that gives me kind of like level two points. And the, the point system in California is. One is low security, two is a little bit higher, three is medium security, level four is highest security. And then on level four, there's five sections of the level four. So when they took me to classification, even though I had level two points for the nature of the crime, you know, the cops classifying me are also cops and I broke into an armory and I stole from cops. So they're like, okay. I mean, they do have to send a message, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So here's what they go. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to put you on a level four 180, which is basically the highest level four they have for 180 day periods of period of observation. And for the viewers that can see me, I'm I'm a white guy with glasses. I'm kind of you know square looking. So when you get to the level four 180, everyone's like shaved hair, head, goatee, tatted back. You know they're like the convicts you see in movies. And uh, then I roll up in there. And they're like, well, they're like, you're in the wrong prison. Supposed to be the like federal white collar prison. What are you doing here? That's exactly what they said to me. They go, what are you doing here? <laughs> and I was like, well, I broke in the armor and I stole all the cops' guns. What are you doing here? <laughs> so I go, I'm here for, you know, robbery or murder. Oh. So they give you any, like, I hate to use this word joke credit. They give you joke credit for what you did. Like, still, like oh, oh, shit, you did some shit, right? Absolutely. Yeah. It's like, that was the funniest thing is the cops thought they were going to put me on this level four 180. And when I mentioned that's like that on the level four, there's five levels. I was on the fourth highest level. The only level above me was a shoe, which is basically the long-term segregation. So they put me on like the worst prison you possibly could. In California, you had Pelican Bay, Tehachapi, Corcoran, New Folsom, High Desert. Like there's only a few, like out of the 160 prisons in California, there's only five or six level four 180s. And I was on one of them. So I was like on this, the most dangerous prison you can get to in California. 
And then <laughs> that's what the cops were thinking. They're like, we're going to put him on the worst yard we have and that he's just going to get murdered. Of course, what I do is I show up and they're like, well, what are you doing here and what's your crime? And for the listeners that don't know, you kind of, I got schooled when I was going through a kind of orientation in prison. And orientation is basically like that classification system where they decide where they're going to put you. And I had a celly and my celly was kind of telling me, here's how you behave when you get to the prison you're going to, because they're going to fuck you. <laughs> and the way you do it is, you know, I, I think we see these prison movies where people go, there'll be some interaction between these two convicts on prison. And they're like, hey, what are you here for? And the other little guy will be like, mind your own fucking business. You know, I, I don't need to talk to you. Or like, I'm not going to tell you why I'm here, which is actually the wrong answer. Like, that's how you're going to get stabbed real fast. So in California, the way you're supposed to do it is when you roll onto your yard, you have your paperwork that says why you're in prison. It's like, a one, it's a sheet called like a 128A or G or something like that. So you just roll up to the shot caller on the yard and there's a hierarchy in prison. It's actually management. There's a guy that runs a yard. There's a guy that runs each building. There's a guy that runs each tier. And it's like a- And these are the prisoners doing this. Yeah, the prisoners are like the, the shot caller is the big, the big prisoner, the big, he's got the keys to the yard, they call it. And all the analogies are car analogies. So he's got the keys. And so you just, you talk to whoever's running your tier or your building and you don't want them to have to come to talk to you. Like if they don't know you, if they come talk to you, like, dude, what are you doing here? You see, you just flip the scripts with the coaching I got, which is you just find the guy running the place and go, hi, I'm Dirk. Here's my paperwork. Here's why I'm here. Uh, I'm from Santa Barbara, but I'm not affiliated. And what that means is- Not gang, not gang affiliated. Yeah, because otherwise they want to know where you're from, if what gang you're in, because that kind of classifies you in the prison on who you should be hanging out with. And then maybe they're beefing with your particular gang. <laughs> So it's like, hey, I'm from Washington, fell from Santa Barbara. I'm not affiliated. I'm just just a guy that stole a bunch of guns. <laughs> so I wish I could see the look on that guy's face when he's ready to crime. Like, you did what? Yeah, it's funny because one of the guys, when I was uh, going th through that whole conversation, I got out to the yard, his name was Big Red. And he goes, oh, I heard about you. Because apparently for him, he was going through court and he had like three murders. And the detectives came to him because he's like, I think he's in Ventura County. I, I fell from Santa Barbara and they're right, right next to each other. And they, the cops had no idea who did this for maybe six or eight months. Um, and they asked him to go, they, they thought maybe like the Aryan, you know, the Aryan gangs were involved with this, this gun theft. So they told him, they said, hey, we're gonna make all your crimes go away if you tell us where our guns are. And his, his version of the story was, I told them to fuck themselves. <laughs> it's like, maybe. Maybe because you didn't know where the guns were. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe if you didn't know where the guns were, might have been a different conversation. So in prison, like you talk about the different uh, stage or whatever, do they kind of segregate like from like like murderers from from robbers from like oh it's just everyone just thrown into together? Yeah, it's kind of like in that classification system, like lowest levels, like probably drug offenders, um, and the higher you go up in the custody level, generally that means the type of crime you had. So you know the murderers are all in that group, and. Uh, as you do your time, you kind of drop down to custody. So like if you're on the level four and you've behaved yourself for a number of years, you can go to level three, level two. Um, so the, the the hidden blessing to that whole thing was, I don't know if you've seen those pictures of, in California of prison yards where people like living in the gymnasium mm -hmm. and, the, and they're in these like bunks that are like triple bunks. Yeah. Yeah. And they're like, you know, there'll be a thousand people because California is so overcrowded, they would repurpose a gymnasium into a housing unit. So if I actually ended up on a level two or a level three where I should have gone, I would have been living in a gym with three people bunked in my little bunk and there'd be rows of 50 of those things. So it'd be like a thousand people in this gym, straight fucking chaos. But what they did instead is they overrode me, put me in the level four 180 where I had my own cell. So it's like one of the most secure prisons in California and I got my own cell. So you find you when you get it, go to prison, they just tell you, and this is like kind of the benefit of the level four 180 is that it's such a dangerous place that the guards don't really mess with you. Like other places, they'll, they'll tell you where you're going to live. At this prison, they, they say, when you're new there, they go, okay, here's a, here's the 10 cells that, that are, have open bunks, figure out where you want to live. So you just walk around saying, hi, <laughs> hi, I'm Dirk. And the guy, the guy in the bunk says, get the hell out of here. You just get the hell out of here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, the first guy I talked to, his name was Danny. We hit it off. Great guy. We lived together for a couple of years. And uh, 
That's how it works. I have to imagine having a, a good roommate has to be a good cellmate to go a long way. Yeah, absolutely. Because like you and your your cellies are are pretty uh pretty tight after you know years of living together. I mean, in a way, you basically like college roommates, right? If you think about it, right? Exactly. Without it's, without all the traffic yeah. in college. Yeah. Um, and which is a whole lot better than living in in a gym, a noisy, crowded, just terrible gym for. So how come more people don't do this? I know it has like do suck sucks college and stuff like that. It's like more people like do like of course not do something bad, but maybe do something crazy where they're forced to put them in solitary solitary confinement. It's like be safe to be solitary confinement versus being on the yard, so to speak, right? But I know then you get most people can't be alone themselves, and you'll bet shit crazy being by yourself. That plays into it, I'm sure. Yeah. So, so what was the question? Like, how come more people don't purposely get thrown into solitary confinement? Oh, it's terrible because you. Okay, so the difference is solitary confinement is there's really no interaction outside of your little cell. Um, and that's why I mentioned the shoe was. So the shoe is solitary confinement. Basically, you're living in your cell 24 hours a day. You never go anywhere. But when you be like, it's not more safer than being out in the yard. Well, yeah, it's it's funny too. Like, safer. What does that mean? Um, usually, like if you see like TV shows and they're like, it's like, oh my god, my husband. Like you'll have some wife calling the the warden of the prison. Oh my god, my husband's in prison. Put him in solitary confinement for his safety. And it sounds like it. I was like, oh, he's safe. He's in solitary confinement. It's fucked because you're living in a cell. You might have a roommate, maybe not, but you're in the cell. You never leave. Yeah. Um, sometimes they'll have yard, but it's not really yard. It's like a yard you only go to individually. So maybe your cell goes to the yard. You work out for an hour a day. You come back to your cell. So 23 hours a day, you're in your cell. And if you choose to go to yard, it's not that great. So like, yeah, I spent some time in solitary. Half the time, I wouldn't even go to the yard. I, I would just work out in my cell and I don't need to walk 50 feet down the tier to work out in a, a hot, dusty concrete, a different concrete box than my concrete box. Um, so sol solitary is terrible. Okay. If you're in general population, you know, you go to yard with regular people, you know, that maybe a couple of three, four hours a day. You have a job duty, you might have an educational program. You go to meals together um, if your institution has that kind of program. So here's a question for you. Tell us something that was good about jail and then something that bad about it. <laughs> I I hate to say this, and I and I and I repeat this every once in a while these days, is what I miss. I actually miss something about prison, which is the ability to read all day long. Um, I'm I'm a reader. I like to read, and now that I'm free, uh, and I'm running an organization, I don't have any free time. Um, I carve out some time to ride my motorcycle in the circles. <laughs> but other than that, it's like, I like to read books and books take a, long, a lot of time to read. And I don't have that much non-designated time just to sit down and just read. Um, as opposed to when I was in prison and education was my program, I was reading my school books all the time. Um, you know, just me and my celly were gelling in our cell. I just make a coffee or eat our food in the cell and I could just read all day long. And that was really enjoyable for me. So. I definitely don't want to go back to prison so I can read more, <laughs> but I really enjoy the ability just to like take that time, relax, read a book. There's no, no pressures on me. Now I, I feel guilty. Like if I'm reading a book, it's like, Oh, there's all these things that I should be doing that are productive. Um, of course the obvious things is what's bad about prison. Yeah. That's a, that's a long fucking list. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll, what I'll say is, the first thing I did when I got out of prison is I had a really, really great meal at a restaurant. <laughs> um, this this old uh, old friend of mine, we had been friends for since the early 90s. She's the only person that visited me in prison that I knew that was not family member. So she visited me over the 15 years, and her name was Stacy. The moment we got out, she took me to Toulouse Petite in Seattle, up on Queen Anne. I had the best steak ever. I mean, the steaks are amazing anyways. But they're super amazing. <laughs> I, I can imagine. In comparison to prison food. And you got out in you got out in 2004, 2005? Uh yeah. My my rebirth day is May 7th, 2015. So do you still keep in touch with any like the prison guard and the inmates from your doing your time? Well, that's all like your past history and that's prison guard is not so much. We weren't really uh yeah. <laughs> we weren't buddies. Um prisoner is some of them, yeah, okay. for sure. All right. And it's funny. Because even when I was doing time, I would, you know, we're talking about cost benefit analyses. I would actually think to myself, it's like, I had friends in there, you know, you make friends wherever you go. And I would say to myself, it's like, hey, I'm I'm buddies with this dude, but would we still be friends in a different situation? It's like we're kind of in this fishbowl and we don't have that many opportunities to 
hang out with different people. So it's like you f- kind of hang out with who you hang out with, but you always wonder, would we still be friends yeah. if we could be friends with anybody? And some of those people, the answer is yeah. You know, after years in prison, knowing them, you get out, they're still the great, same great person. And was there ever a time of physically we were like, man, like, what are you like really scared for your life? Like, you know, I don't know if I'm gonna be alive tomorrow or whatever the case may be. No, never scared for my life. Okay. Um, I think I was probably too stupid to understand how dangerous it was. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, like, I'll, I'll tell, tell you a California story. So my first job in California, you know, before my educational program started running, was I, I was on yard crew. And yard crew is basically, you just walk around picking up trash off the, the yard because there's nothing growing down there. It's, it's in the Tehachapi Desert, you know, just a dust bowl. And since this was at level 4180 prison, all the violence happens on the yard. Um, out of the 900 people on the yard, I think only two or three people were ever going home. And I was one of them. Everyone else's life, life without, you know. And because they had so much time and they were never expected to see the streets again, they just didn't give a shit. So like it wasn't, if they were going to stab somebody, it wasn't going to be behind some some corner where nobody could see them. They would just do it right out in the middle of the yard because they're just building their resume by being ultra violent. And if they get caught for the stabbing, they just go to the shoe for six months, come back out to the yard. It's just a little cycle of violence. So anyways, because all the violence happened on the yard, probably every week and a half, maybe every two weeks, somebody would get stabbed. And what that means is, you know, you just have that on the yard playing handball or doing pull-ups or whatever you're doing. All of a sudden you see a couple of people just going at it, which is basically stabbing each other. And then the guard's reaction is they have a guard tower and they shoot tear gas and block guns. And then they come out, sometimes they'll shoot the actual gun gun, which is a little mini 14. Um, So everyone gets down on the yard, but it's the most amazing thing because you feel like you're in Beirut because you're laying down on the ground. There's tear gas going flying through the air. There's block guns or bullets going off. And you're like, wow, who gets to see this? Like, this is pretty dangerous, right? It's like, they're not shooting at you, so you have that comfort. But at the same time, it's like, you're in a literal war zone. I mean, tear gas is still tear gas. Tear, I've, I've been... Yeah, so I'm okay with tear gas. Pepper spray messes me up. So I can, I can handle the tear gas, but pepper spray, no bueno. <laughs> so are there like any standards of conduct in the prison yard? Like, for example... I would think that, you know, if someone's lifting weights, you don't stab them with lifting weights. Like, you at least wait till they, the, they finish, then stab them. Yeah, and there's, there's like, nuances to that. Like, generally, it's all, like, straight up man-on-man shit. Like, you, you give, you let someone know, you know, a heads up, we're coming for you. Unless they think that guy's a piece of shit. Unless they think he's, like, a snitch or a sex offender or some other non-great crime, mm-hmm. then the rules are off. Then they'll just... Okay. Then then it might be it might be two or three on one like three people come up and just completely annihilate him. But if it's like if it's more of a you know a personal beef or maybe a drug debt or n- nothing against the the nuances of prison culture. And once you're in prison, like maybe five six years, did you then you like okay so and so's coming in next week? You you're like I got reports of who's coming in. Yeah, I I didn't know that information because. I wasn't really that. You want, you want the shot caller? Yeah, the, but the shot callers know they they like they know who's like somehow you know. Okay, so the the inmates run the entire institution from like meals to laundry to gymnasium to admin. So there's some inmate run, working at admin. He, so know, he, he yeah. sees a roster who's coming in, and they know all the names. So like some other, and there's a whole network of communication. So like you might some one of their buddies might leave Corcoran, and he might hear that he's on his way there. So they kind of know who's coming. And so not saying this is a claim of fame, but you were actually on a America's Most Wanted, right? I was, and that's that's how they caught me. Yeah. America's Most Wanted. I mean, it sounds cool. Do you, do you it, still have the do you still have the video from that? No, I, I wanted to get the video. I could never find the video, but I have my little I have my little paper write up. I, my my brother printed printed off the internet. Not not the one when they're looking for me, but the one that says captured. Yeah. <laughs> Man, that's be that'd be insane, right? I mean, it sounds cool. I mean, it sounds like, you know, something great to talk about until you're doing 15 years for your crimes and then that show. So all, all was it John Walsh? Yeah, John, John Walsh, Walsh yeah. got me. <laughs> John Walsh. So in prison, did you start doing your nonprofit in prison or you had the idea for out of prison? Can you yeah. talk about that story? Yeah, so let's, let's talk about the good part, of, like the better part of doing your time in prison. So, of course, once I got there in 2000, I realized the Pell Grant was taken away from prisoners. Kind of fucked. Um, 
And I couldn't believe it. I was like, look, if we have all these guys sitting in this cage with all this time on their hands, you know, I could read all day long. If I could read all day long, maybe I should learn something like college. <laughs> I mean, it's, it seems so obvious. And it's, that's why it's so hard to understand why Congress took away the funding for. So quick question. For reading, can you request any book you want to and have to give it to you, or is it only the books in that prison library, so to speak? Yeah, there's like a little book cart that comes around. Like, okay. And some, some prisons have a library. Some prisons like have a little book cart. And you're, you'll get all your, read all your Dean Kuntz's and Stephen King's and Louis Lemoore's, you know, just the standard paperbacks. Um, so I read, you know, a couple of years of those. And that's where that epiphany happens. Like, I'm doing the reading anyways. I'm reading all these books just because you can't do that many push-ups. So maybe wouldn't it be great if i could read a book and learn something at the same time which is of course how you figure out college is a good idea um and then so it took me a couple of years i was writing i was writing churches and charities and all sorts of nonprofits because i found out that penn state had these distance education courses but they're like 500 bucks a class which is a, a good deal these days but back then 500 bucks is expensive um my dad and I hadn't reconnected, so my dad wasn't paying for anything. I didn't have any money, even though I talk about how much money I made doing my crimes. Well, I didn't I didn't save any of it, <laughs> so I, I was broke. Um, I wrote 300 letters to churches and charities, and then 300 letters to local businesses, just, just a, a letter-writing marketing campaign. Um, nobody, the only people that responded... So the original co-email campaign. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is really... <laughs> The only people that actually responded were the Mormons. I mean, they they actually sent me a letter saying no, which is I respected that. At least they took the time to tell me to, you know, they're not gonna pay for it. Um, then after that, then my dad came to visit me. And I think I just finally talked him into it. And he started paying for my education. And uh, I was so thankful that I figured if my dad's gonna pay for it, the least I can do is work as hard as I can. So I basically got straight A's in every class except for one class I got an A minus, which shows that I'm human. Um, Any class that were online, distance learning? No, there's nothing. You know, this is all paper-based. Okay. You do it through the mail, which, okay. which is super hard because if you have a question for your instructor. Yeah, but ask how do you ask questions. Yeah, you write them a letter. Say, hey, I got this question. And then maybe a week <laughs> two, later. Two, two weeks, weeks later, later, you'll get a response. And so it took me 10 years to get a four-year degree. Being a student, were you allowed like make phone calls to your professor or anything since you're going to school? Not really. No. Okay. With no special, you know, he's trying to get the better stuff. No, and in fact, you know, most of the, the prison guards, and you know, they're not college educated, so nobody's looking at you like, "Way to go, way to way to go to college," because we really they're probably like, "He can go to college. He's a convict. I can't." Yeah, that I would I would get a lot of negative feedback from prison guards. They would see me going to like I I was one of the few people going to you know they're like where's my program at? Yeah, it's like I can't go to college. I have to pay for my own college. Like one prison guard, he said that. He didn't. He didn't know that my dad was paying for college. He thought that I was somehow getting some free program, like like they they looked down on the Pell Grant. Like prisoners shouldn't get the Pell Grant because he has to pay for his daughter to go to school. Well, everyone that's poor in America gets a Pell Grant. Yeah. It, it's needs based. It's not like there's only so many Pell Grants, and if a prisoner gets one, then your daughter doesn't yeah. get one. If your daughter's poor, she gets one too. Yeah, that's how it works. And you know the funding level is like, I think it's like thirty five million in a 38 billion dollar Pell Grant uh, educational budget. Or, I mean, the Pell Grant budget was 38 billion. Prisoners got like 35 million of it. So less than 1%. Um, it wasn't like prisoners are soaking up all this Pell Grant money. And yeah, so you grew from Penn State? Yeah, so yeah, I got- I got What's the degree? Uh, business administration and organizational leadership. Why those degrees? That's pretty much all they offered. <laughs> okay, well, that's, yeah. a, that's a good reason. <laughs> yeah, it's like I wanted, they had the two-year degree in business administration, and then their only four-year degree options, you know, this is through the, the paper base, through the mail, was like logistics, supply chain management, which are almost the same thing, um, organizational leadership, and then like a liberal arts degree. And this online degree, anybody could join. It wasn't just only for prisoners. Anyone, yeah, yes. Yeah, it was through you know, the world it. campus, which okay. is really cool because it's not like you weren't getting this watered down degree for prisoners it wasn't like some some cheesy diploma mill that you're doing through the mail it's fucking penn wasn't state. some feel good thing penn state did or yeah it's actually penn state it's a world campus now they're 100 online but in those days they were online and they had paper-based um so my degree came from penn state and there's no distinction between my degree from penn state and somebody else's 
Penn State degree. And so when you graduated, was like, you get, were you able to do some kind of graduation ceremony? It was just like, here's a piece of paper you graduated, go back in your prison cell. Yeah, so funny story about that. Um, since the, the Pell Grant was taken away from prisoners, all the college education programs were shut down. And I wasn't allowed to use the educational resources for my my correspondence study because my correspondence study program was not part of the educational program that was funded inside the prison. And in these days, the only things that were funded were the ABE GED courses, which is adult basic education, the GED. They had some ESL courses. Um, they had some like computer literacy courses. So they had like, they did have an education department and they had a couple classes. And what I would do is I would go make friends with the Dean of Education and they're not like prison guards because they're kind of, they're a dean of education. So they're, they're generally pro-education. So I come along and say, hey, can I use your computer to type my assignments? Because it's a whole lot easier than using a golf pencil. <laughs> and some of the times that, that would work. So the funny thing is when I finally got my two-year degree, um, I actually transferred to a different prison where the dean of education was not on board with Team Dirk. <laughs> so when I got my two-year degree, and now I was up back up in Washington. So this is the Washington Department of Corrections. And they were having a, a, a graduation ceremony for the GED students. Of course, the Prison Scholar Fund, well, we can talk about it later, but the Prison Scholar Fund was up and running. We had some of our students in that institution. And I got my two-year degree. So I told, I told the, or I asked the Dean of Education, I go, hey, I know it's a GED ceremony, but could I show up and get, get my, you know, celebrate my two-year degree? And I, and I'm sure my dad would appreciate it because he funded for this whole thing and he might appreciate the little celebration. And she said, no, she's like, well, this is only for the GED students. It's like, okay, okay, look, I know you have punch and cake. It's like, I promise we're not going to, you know, we're not going to eat any of your cake or drink any of your, your punch, but it might be a nice ceremony. So not only would it be great to like, my dad might enjoy it, but also the people that are getting their GED, they might like to see that, hey, this guy just got an associate's degree or he got a college degree. That's the next step for you after your GED. And since the Prison Scholar Fund was operational, we could help. So they're, they're really not giving me that opportunity and also maybe cutting the path for other students where they could take their next, next step through education. So well, you're doing your, your college stuff. I mean, you're, you're busy, right? Back to imagine, even though you're, you're doing your college stuff, you had to be bored of your mind a lot of times. Like, and other prisoners are really bored because they're not doing anything. Like, how do prisoners, and you or other prisoners, how do y'all deal with the boredom? Yeah, I, I'm never bored of, as long as I'm with myself. <laughs> um, I th yeah, I think boredom affects people differently. I, I've never been a person to suffer from boredom. Okay. I just, I think that's kind of how the, I started the nonprofit. It's like, uh, and also probably why I get into trouble a lot because I'll always figure out something to do. So what year in prison were you when you got, when you got your, your four-year degree? Okay, so let's see. Um, I think it was 2006? I think it was okay. 2006. Okay. And so you, were, so, so you did another nine years in your, in your bachelor's degree. And then what, were you, what year did you start your prison scholar fund? Okay, so yeah, so let's do the timeline. So I think in, I went, I got to prison in 2000. I think I started my educational journey in 2002. That's when my dad finally started paying for it. I started the Prison Scholar Fund informally in 2004. That was like when I kind of had the idea for it, like, cause, cause I was doing my education for a couple of years. And what happened was I would see a lot of people, I'd be in the day room with my school books. People would come up and they'd say, dude, how are you going to school? I want to do the same thing. And after, you know, 50 people say this to you, like there is a demand for people changing their lives through education. You can call it boredom. Like maybe, hey, I, I'm so bored. What should I do with myself? Or some of them are genuinely, you know, they want to learn, change the path of their trajectory. So back when I, I mentioned that I was, I was trying to write, write letters to fund my education that didn't work. And I was like, well, maybe we could, we could, maybe we could do that differently. And maybe we could raise like me because I didn't even know what a what nonprofit was so I was like let's just raise money for other prisoners to go to school how can we do that and so we're like in prison you know where we talk about boredom some people are artists like some people send their cells all day long for 20 years and they just write you know they draw beautiful things or they're tattoo artists so there's a lot of talent inside a prison 
Um, and I was thinking, hey, maybe we could take some of this art and make make calendars or mouse pads or T-shirts. We could sell something. Um, and I, I got my dad on board with that to help, but he's, you know, it was very limited on what he could do. But we didn't have a marketing budget. We had no way to produce these things. And even when we sell them online, like, yeah, like cafepress.com, they can do one-off things. Um, I just couldn't get it off the ground. It just, but the idea of helping other prisoners happened in 04. And then in 05, I got transferred back to Washington. So why did they transfer you back? Oh, because my California time was done. So and I, what, I got, and Washington wanted a piece. Yeah, I had I had all my crimes in Washington that I fled from. I had federal charges and I had my California time. And in California, they gave me 10 years, but I, I did five years of halftime. So I did from you know 2000 to about 2005. And then they transferred me back to Washington. And then when I got to Washington, um, it was the funniest conversation. I, I, I think I, I think I had this conversation. Yeah, it was when I got back to California, back to Washington, because I was talking about trying to raise money for other prisoners to go to to go to to go to school. And this guy goes, "Oh, you should start a nonprofit." And I was like, "What's that?" <laughs> It's like, well, it's an organization, and you, it basically formalizes what I was already doing, just raising money to help other people. I was like, okay, um, sure. I mean, I'm all sorts of, I'm, I'm down for bad ideas. It's like, how, are, how, how am I, how am I going to start a nonprofit from prison? Um, so there's, there's organizations that help nonprofits get started. So I just got a list of these organizations. I started writing them. I was like, hey, what do you need to start a nonprofit? They're like, okay, you need articles of incorporation, you need a board, you need bylaws. So I got all this boilerplate, it's like trying to figure out. And this time I was up in Washington and the director of education was actually great. So she was helping me research these nonprofit assistance centers, get this information I needed. And then just when I was about ready to, to start the prison scholar fund from prison, I got transferred to Arizona. And this is because uh, Washington was overcrowded, so they were moving people out of state to those private prison facilities. You know, this is Corrections Corporation of America. They can house people for cheaper. So Washington saves money. You know, it's just warehousing people for money, which is not so great. But the good news for Dirk and his Prison Scholar Fund is everything goes through the mailroom in Washington. Like if I wanted to start a nonprofit in Washington, every letter I send out gets read. And even though the the director of education might be on board with Dirk's crazy nonprofit idea, you know, abstractly, like she probably didn't think I was really going to do it. I was just like learning how to do it. But as soon as I tried to like form these articles and corporations through the, like mailing things in the mailroom and the mailroom's going to read my letters <laughs> and that's going to stop it right there. They're like, Oh, fuck no. What, what, what does he, what does he think he's doing? He's not starting a nonprofit for him here. That that's not what we're doing. So that never would have happened in Washington, but in Arizona at these private prison facilities, they're basically run by people that like, they have want ads on billboards. You, you can get a job at Target. You could get a job at Correction Corporation of America. It's just regular dudes off the street working for minimum wage in the mailroom, which that means is drugs and porn and all sorts of bad things flow in. In my case, grant applications and nonprofit material flowed out. They didn't read my mail. They didn't give a shit what I was doing. <laughs> So I started the nonprofit from Cal uh, Arizona, and uh, thank you very much. Nice. So, um, how did you go about like fundraising the nonprofit while in prison? That's a great, great question. That happened next, and that was when I was talking to this, this a different old timer. For the first guy told me the nonprofits existed. It's like, okay, we've got to formalize this thing. And and I remember I was gonna, thinking I was going to sell those calendars or mouse pads or T-shirts, but since I didn't have a marketing budget or you know operational costs, that couldn't really happen. Um, so a different guy, now that I have a nonprofit, you know, and my dad was helping me on the street. So he's not a business guy, but he was bouncing all the mail for me. So I'd use his address as the organizational's address. Our first board was me, my dad, and his, his buddy, Ruben. <laughs> so there's our board. And then got the articles, everything signed in, in February 2nd, 2006, we got our 501c3. Um, and then that we have now that we actually have a 501c3 and it's a real organization, then it's like coming out of fundraising. How are we going to raise money for this thing? And I thought we had to raise money like a business sells things to earn money. But then I was talking, to, like I mentioned, I was talking to this, this old timer, and uh, he goes, Why don't you write some grants? I was like, What's that? <laughs> what, what's a grant? 
we want to have one of those? Yeah, we got one in a minute. Once you finish your water. How about that one? Okay. And I said, what's a grant? He goes, well, uh, there's foundations out there and you write the foundations a grant request and they give you money. I was like, let me get this right. I was like, <laughs> I was like are you sure you've actually done this? <laughs> like, you're not bullshitting me. He's like, he's, I, I don't know. Like, is this a prank? Yeah. Like, you won't get me in trouble. It's like, you, you write them a letter and they give you money. And that's, that, they're in business to do that. I was like, no. Was like, you've actually done this. He's like, hey, he explained the letter of inquiry process, the whole thing, what grant applications look like. So I was like, okay. And uh, the problem is generally how it works for like unsolicited grant requests, you do a letter of inquiry, which is like a two-page document. It's like a really brief summary of what you do. And um, when you send the letter of inquiry to the foundation, they decide if they want a full grant proposal. Um, and the problem here, there's, there's a funny problem. Like one, one of the problems is like, how do you find the foundation to write to? And so I spent, you know, I was, I was doing a lot of reading. So and this is back when those phone books, right? The internet just yeah, started. Yeah, we, started. Had, we had phone books, but you know, they, they only, you know, limited vicinity on a phone book. So I was doing a lot of reading. I was reading Business Week, Forbes, Entrepreneur, all these magazines. And over maybe six months, I came up with a list of 142 foundations. Just, you know, the, the names pop up over time. So when I was getting ready to roll, I had this list of 142 foundations and I just found friends of mine on the tier. Hey, go ask your mom if she can Google it. I don't think we had Google then. We had Yahoo or... Um, well, was it Netscape? Next, I think it was Netscape back then, right? Netscape? Were they a sort search engine? I think so. I know Yahoo was. Well, yeah, whatever. Go Yahoo that. Um, and so I had a whole bunch of people getting addresses for me. So before you know it, I had 142 addresses. My dad even found a few. He's not very good with the computer, but he got me maybe 10 addresses. But these are all we know at this point is we have 142 foundations and their addresses. All across the United States. All across the United States. We have no fucking idea what they do. So, uh, oh, oh I, I, there's, a, there's a piece I missed to this. Okay, so what happened is I read a lot. Okay, so here's a little, we're going to plug this into the story I'm telling here in a second. Um, we're, I was reading a lot, and, and prison is such a microcosm, like an inverse microcosm of society that I was taking, I was taking these psychology classes, which was just fascinating for me. And one of the books, it was Intro to Psychology, the same author wrote Social Psychology, and the same author then wrote like an abnormal psychology book. And I read all those books. His name was David Myers, and he was a professor of psychology at Hope College in Michigan. So I wrote him just because I was fascinated with psychology. And we just started a relationship over time, just a pen pal relationship. So because I had few, very few friends, I never asked him for money because I didn't want to ruin it. So to speak. Yeah, yeah, I didn't want to be like it become like a prison hustle. Yeah. Um, but anyways, once I I had been keeping him up to breast of what I was doing, which is trying to start this crazy nonprofit. And what I didn't know was he actually had a foundation. So around 2005 or 2006, as I was trying to get this thing off the ground and I got my 501c3, he sent me a check for a thousand bucks. He goes, hey, here's for your, your new nonprofit. Good luck with that thing. And with that thousand bucks, I was able to give my very first scholarship to my last roommate from, from Tehachapi in California. And was that the first like actual person? Yeah, the first person we actually funded. So that was like University of Colorado had like a partial scholarship. Like, so we, we ended up having to pay like 300 bucks for this guy to go to University of Colorado. Um, so poof, now we actually have our very first student now we got 700 bucks left. And then my dad, you know, we create an application process and we have a whole bunch of people applying at this point. And come, my dad becomes like, hey, let's just award some more scholarships. It's like, all we got is 700 bucks left. Where's the money coming from? You know, so that's when I learned about foundations and all that stuff. Got that list of 142 foundations. And my dad's up in Washington and I'm down in Arizona and I'm telling my dad, hey, send me some more postage money because on, on your prison accounts, your postage money does not get taxed as opposed to like commissary money. They take like half of. So if you put the money on my postage account, I can use all of that money to buy postage. So he's sending me hundreds and hundreds of dollars on my postage account. And every, you know, every time I, I send a eight by 10 an envelope to a foundation, you know, it costs like a buck 26 or whatever it is. So I spend a couple hundred bucks on, on letters, envelopes, postage, all this stuff. 
and my dad's getting mad. He's like, you're, you're, you're just wasting all this money. Those foundations are never going to give you anything. And uh, we could be giving out scholarships for those. And he's probably right. Um, Cause what actually happened was my poor father, <laughs> who's, you know, paid for all my education. He's been a great supporter. He's sitting up at his house in Bothell. And, and remember I, I wrote 142 of these letters of inquiry. And what I did was instead of just a two page letter of inquiry, I made that, but I also had like six or eight pages of like addendums. I had some research and a little bit more about the program. So it was more of a complete package than just a straight LOI. Cause I was like, I'm just going to go all in. So yeah. I'm good. just going to go all in. So they don't have to ask me for more information. And of course we were, we were like, my budget was super easy. Um, so my poor dad, he's up in Washington. He's getting, he's getting 141 rejections. <laughs> Every time he opens the mailbox, he's got a no letter. It's like, It'll be something like from the Woods Foundation of Chicago. It's like, sorry, we only fund organizations in Chicago. Or it might be a cancer research foundation. Sorry, we only fund cancer research. Sorry, we only fund environmental issues. There's all these reasons my, my grants were mistargeted because I didn't know what the foundations did. All I knew was the name of a foundation. <laughs> so, so my poor dad's getting beat up and it's really straining our relationship because every time I'm talking on the phone, he's like, I told you, I told you, you're wasting your money writing these foundations. I was like, after, after so many of these, he's kind of right. And then he gets a phone, a phone call from the Annenberg Foundation and the, the, the grant officer is almost laughing because it's, it's a billion dollar foundation. I think it's like 14 billion. They call up my dad and go, <laughs> oh yeah, oh, so, and more context is, on my grant applications, I had two. I had one for 14 grand, it was like 14.8, and one was 28.8. I just had two different budgets. I didn't know which budget to do. So it's like A-B testing. <laughs> it's like, I'll just, I'll just send out two budgets, see which one's bites. And uh, the Annenberg Foundation, this billion dollar foundation, they get my request for 14 grand. It's like, damn, I wish they got the 28 grand. But they called my dad up and they're like, I, I, see, you're, I see you want 14 grand. <laughs> they start laughing. Where do you want the check? So they. They sent us 14 grand. Mm -hmm. And then that program officer loved what we did so much, especially for the fact that I did this from prison. Mm -hmm. He goes, hey, I got a friend at the Bannerman Foundation. Let me go talk to him. They sent us eight grand. And before you know it, we raised like 60 grand within like a year, which is like a million bucks. Like if you're a prisoner and you raise 60 grand, that's... So then my dad, you know, he shifted gear super fast. Like, you know, these foundations, <laughs> <laughs> not such a bad idea. So the, the first person that took advantage of your program have you still kept in touch with him? Like, no. how, do you know if he took advantage of the program? Like, how to turn that for I him? I don't. Like, he was he first person to take a class, first person to drop off. Yeah. So, I think that when I was leaving him in California, he had eight years left. And then I tried every once in a while, I'll Google his name just to see if I can find him. Um, no idea. Nothing. Yeah. yeah. And, and like, after, he, after, I don't even know if he finished the course. So, or if he dropped out, maybe he's a victim of violence in California. Who knows? Yeah. Anything. Yeah. Cause he was a, he was kind of a, a rowdy dude, so anything could happen. So I know you on your website you have like a bunch of success, sto success stories. Can you highlight one of your success stories, either on the website or all through the time of the of the fund? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> let me think of probably the, the coolest. Maybe the coolest success story is a recent one. Uh, and this is a guy that we started a coding boot camp, and that is we wanted to bring it inside of the prison where we, basically people learn how to become computer engineers. And this is like another fantasy I had. Like when I was in prison, you know, I, I enjoyed reading, but also before I got to prison, you know, I tried to do some HTML and CSS. I tried to do make web pages. That was one of my failed businesses while I was being a criminal. But the problem was this is like 95, 96. The internet wasn't really a thing yet. So even though I can make web pages with HTML and CSS, I was trying to sell those to companies and businesses and restaurants and nightclubs and nobody was really on the internet. And so I would have to convince these people. I was like, look, I'll make you a webpage, charge you 30 bucks a month. And they're like, yeah, nobody's on the internet. What do I need a webpage for? So it was tough to sell a thing because I was so, uh, so ahead of the curve. Um, that business failed and I just kept stealing things and selling them. That, that, that was actually something I could do. Um, but the point is, when, then once I got to prison and the you know internet kind of took off and Amazon became a thing, I was like, wow, in addition to reading, just imagine if you had a laptop in prison. You could just code all day long. You can make a video game. You can make apps. You could just 
just think like all that free time you could just and like a lot of people that do coding or like computer people you know when i was in the free world pre-prison a lot of my computer friends they would be at their computer 12 hours a day they'd be chain smoking have a a a, a, a pile of mountain dew empty cans you know and they're right you know everything they need is right there um yeah, it's kind of like prison. Everything you see is right there. The toilet's even closer. <laughs> so having a coding program inside a prison could be a really great thing if you had the aptitude for it. Um, and then, of course, once I got out, we finally got one launched. In 2001, we got one launched. And it's a coding boot camp. It's not inside the prison yet, but we catch the people coming out. And so we have a partnership with some of the education departments because they have like basic computer programming things. And two places in Washington have better programs. One's in Walla Walla and one's at Clallam Bay. And they teach people the HTML, the CSS, some Java, some, some kind of basic stuff. But you're kind of identifying the people at that prison that, have, that, are, that are super smart. You have the aptitude for coding. And so we, we get, you know, they kind of pre-screen them for us going through their program. We get the nod. We, we interview them, see if they're a good fit. And then we put them in our coding boot camp. And one of these guys, his name's Danny. Uh, he just got out like three months ago. Um, I, I'll say four months ago now because he just finished the boot camp. I think he finished the boot camp last week because it's a four month, it's a fourteen week program um, th through Coding Dojo. It's a really super cool program, and I'll tell you how that partnership happened in a second. But before Danny even finished the boot camp, he already had a hundred five thousand dollar year contract. And if you think about, it, and Danny had done like I think, I think he did fifteen years also. Um, which is pretty amazing. No, no, he did eight years. A different guy did 15. Um, so we, we want to do more of that. That's pretty awesome. So obviously any, everyone has to go through a program isn't a success case, right? Yeah. So how do you deal with it? How, how do you keep it from like getting, like taking it too personally when someone doesn't make a good program or they go back to jail or like, and they're not successful? How do you keep that from affecting you? Y yeah. Uh, okay. So here's another recent story. This is what was a, uh, a guy how did we, how did we run into this guy? I think he just, I can't remember how he found us, but we interviewed him and he had a, he had a history of drug abuse. And so we knew that was a risk factor. It was like, okay, we really liked him. He's charismatic, kind of outgoing. He's up in OMAC, which is like Okanagan County up in the sticks of Washington. Um, but he seemed like he had a good living situation because he's in like a, a clean and sober living facility. You know, he didn't have any distractions. He had a place that he could study you know, a good quiet place to go to school. Um, and even though we knew that the drug stuff was a risk factor, he's really charismatic. He, he, he won us over with the interview process. And then we sent him a laptop and on, I think we sent him a laptop at like the end of June, July 6th, he was supposed to start the program and he just disappeared. And we didn't find him until just the last week. Um, so what happened is we, we were writing the, the behavioral health facility where he was being housed and they were they were they were really difficult to work with and then we finally we finally got a hold of him and the, the, the problem is we gave him like a two that you know a fifteen hundred dollar laptop to run this program and then uh you know so that's that's not great i mean you know you're dealing with people that have trauma and people that have substance abuse issues so you try to like not let that affect how you feel about the population you serve but then it also opens the door, like, how do we keep that from happening in the future? And I don't know how, because like in this case, you come, you're coming out, you're dealing with a population that has no money, they have no assets, and you're giving them a $1,500 computer. We don't have the computer back right now. It's probably at a pawn shop, probably sold for drugs. But like, how do you take that lesson and say, okay, before we give you a computer, you need some collateral. Yeah. <laughs> That's not going to work. So you have to have some kind of faith in humanity that, you know, we just got to chalk that up as a loss. Hey, you know, the 10 other people that went through the program did great. This one guy, not so great. <laughs> um, How do people find out about your program? Um, just really a lot of word of mouth. Word you know, of most mouth, people yeah. are in prison. They don't have internet. I mean, we do ads on Facebook. We do Google ads. Um, we're kind of in the whole community. A lot of people know what we do. You ever go like do like a, lack of a better term, like do a prison tour where you go to different prisons to say, I'm Dirk, this is my program. I've, I've done that once. And that was... Um, that was in California. It was one of our graduates from our program in California. It's the only time I've been back inside. Um, but the stuff up here, it's like I could, but 
we don't really need to market what we do because we're really the only game in town for post-secondary. Um, our boot camp's really strong, so we don't really we have more of a job turning people away that we can't help. So we don't really need to market. You know, okay. like, we're not trying to go find people. Except for the boot camp, we have more openings for the boot camp than we have applicants. So mm, that's kind of that's, need more that's of that. kind of I would thought be the other way around for that. That's the most amazing thing. <clears throat> so another story there is we do a lot of food security. So when when COVID hit, um, we had a lot of partnerships with like Northwest Harvest, Food Lifeline. We're serving probably 12, 1,300 families on the western side of Washington food um, on a monthly basis. And how that happened was I had an ex-girlfriend that worked at Northwest Harvest. And this is when I think Governor Inslee was giving out $20 million for food security. So they got a shitload of money and they were sitting around their executive leadership team table thinking, hey, who are the most underserved people that we're not serving? And the idea came up with like, hey, formerly incarcerated people, they don't trust the system. They're not on lists. You know, how do we reach this really hard to reach population? And my ex-girlfriend was like, oh, Dirk runs a prison scholar fund. I bet he knows a bunch of formerly incarcerated people. And sure enough, uh, you know, I'm in a bunch of Facebook groups. I'm in a bunch of listservs. So I, I created some marketing messages, floated them out there. And like within a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks, I had over a thousand people on my list that I was delivering food to on the Western side of Washington. So when we got the boot camp off the ground in, in 2021, I tapped that same list and did the same process for the boot camp. And we had the opportunity, but what we didn't know was how many people were signed up. So my board member helped me start this, this thing. And uh, we're like, once we let it fly, we're like, oh my God, how many people are gonna apply? We don't know, because we thought we we're gonna get a shitload of applicants and then people were gonna try to game us for like, since we're giving out a laptop, we're helping with you know living stipend, we're giving you food, we're giving you hygiene. We really wanted to like recreate this prison experience. <laughs> so it's like, you don't have to do anything. I mean, it's not really prison. It, prison inside your own house. But like, you don't have to do anything. You can do this boot camp 100%. We're going to take everything off the table so you can be totally immersed in this boot camp. You don't have to split your time with a job or, or other things. So we figured people were going to try to game us for this opportunity, just at least for the laptop, right? <laughs> and then so we were expecting anywhere from 20 to 200 people applying. In the first month, we got two. Do you think that might be because, like, I'll make this up, of course, like, people are like, you know, like, you really got to be smart to be a software developer. I don't have the brains for that. I think it's even before that. I think a lot of people don't even know what it is. It's like, I think a lot of the, the population we serve, they don't have friends that work at Microsoft or Google or Facebook. They, they don't know they don't know those people. So it's not really part of their language. And I don't think they might even know what computer programmers are. It, it seems so esoteric. It's like, Almost like saying, hey, you want to be a you want to be an astronaut? It's like, I know that thing exists. I have no fucking idea what that is. So that's probably not for me. So let's say, you know, prisoner John Bob applies, right? And you accept him. Does someone at his actual facility have to sign off on it too? No, because we catch it, we we have them, we have them enroll when they get out of prison. Okay. So we're right. catching him on the way out. But they can apply while they're in prison. Yeah. Okay. All and right. And that's when the partnership with the education department, like we'll do we'll do the Zoom interviews uh, in the education department. Has there been a time where someone in the prison had said, like, you know, you shouldn't take this guy? You shouldn't take this guy? Yeah. Like, um, not, like, there's, like, he's not good. I don't think he's good for the program. No, they're, they're very careful with their words. Mm -hmm. So what they'll do is if they like the guy, they'll let you know they like the guy. Mm -hmm. If they don't like the guy. They eh. like, kind of like no comment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, uh, exactly. Like you get a job reference. Yeah, you tell yeah. me about Jason Cavanaugh. He worked here from June 10th to July exactly. 31st. It's like, yes, he is currently an inmate here. How's, that, how's his work ethic? He comes to work on time. Yep, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He comes to work on time, he leaves on time. He doesn't steal the pencils, he's just fine. <laughs> that's, that's pretty much yeah. it. Yeah. So when they apply, like, y'all influence any, like, what to, to study, or oh, that's totally up to them? Like, you say, hey. Oh, well, it's, it's a coding boot camp, so that's. I mean, well, for yeah. the whole program. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for the other thing, um, no, they, get, they do get to choose their course of study, which is actually something really cool about our program. Um, so there are some college education programs across America, but they're mostly liberal arts courses. So the liberal arts from the colleges, they're a big hearted group of people. And so they take, a, they're like, okay, we're going to bring our liberal arts curriculum into the prison and that's going to solve that problem. And don't get me wrong when you're in prison and you don't have any fucking opportunity at all. Let's read, let's, let's do, let's liberal arts is great. I'll yeah. read Moby Dick. I'll read all the yeah. classics. I'll learn how to write. I'll be a poet. Yeah. I'll be it's like, that's great. It's like, it's better than nothing. But if you want to give students student agency, an actual opportunity and like yeah, making money. What do you want to do? Could be business. Could be 
could be art. It could be, you know, uh, computer science. It could be engineering. Like if you actually have your own druthers or what you do, it might not be liberal arts. And then that's what we do is we just fund your education wherever that may be. And so the only hurdle there is finding a college that offers paper-based correspondence courses that is in the field you want to do. And that's harder and harder. And you, have, you, you have them to do that. Yeah, we help them do that. And then the hardest part is back in, two, in the early 2000s, there was a lot of paper-based courses. 20 years later, almost everything's online. So it's really hard to find a college that still does, I'm going to write the assignment on a piece of paper and mail it to you. That's, that's pretty So right. on the website, it says that your uh, recidivism rate is 4%, nationwide is 68%. Like, how do you actually track those numbers? Like, do you track someone like two, three, five years after they finish your program? How those numbers come about? How you get those metrics? Yeah, ex exactly. So when I first got out of prison, we had a partnership with the University of Washington. So I had a whole bunch of interns. And uh, we got the first group, you know, we would get like five or eight people. Yes, please. Oh, but right over here, we get like five or eight uh, college kids, and we would just cyber stalk the hell out of these our our past recipients, and we would just find them. And you know, you know, our data is not perfect. You know, some of the people, if we if we can't find them, we don't really know. But the ones we could find, and I think we found like ninety percent. Sure. Cheers, brother. Thank you. What do you think? I like it. Yeah, so we uh, we literally had to track everyone down. In Washington, we could get information from the state patrol. They had this whole, like we had to do all these permissions to get the data. We could run names from their database and figure out if they'd been rearrested. But the weakness of that data is we could get the data from the state patrol for a Washington person. But that doesn't mean they went, they could have gone to Oregon. They did some shoplifting in Oregon or went to Nevada. So the, the data is kind of weak unless unless you had like a magic wand where you search that one person all across America, find out if they've done anything after that. Um, but that's really the same data everyone else uses. So it is, there's not great data for the, all that stuff. Post someone's in your program. Is there anything you do where you kick them out? Besides, I guess, going back to prison, I guess. Like... I don't think we've ever kicked anyone out. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, not so much kicking out, but like the, the requirements for continued funding for the post-secondary program is like, they'll tell us what they want to do and we'll just fund one class at a time. Okay. And we'll do that for a couple of semesters until they have a track record of completing one class at a time. Like we're not going to pay for four classes and just hope they finish them. And then after they have a good track record of doing one class at a time, you know, and the, the language is really, really clear in the application. It's like, you got to finish your class with a 2.0 or above, which is the same metrics for the Pell Grant, and then, then we'll consider your next class. And we'll consider it meaning, did you make the grade? And then do we have money? Because we don't always have money. Um, so the only time we kick somebody out of the program was like, I think they kicked themselves out. Like they didn't get the grade, they didn't reapply. So either, if we never hear from them, it's either maybe they lost interest in education, <laughs> maybe they didn't get the grade, or maybe they got released and and do you ever have anything I suppose comes somebody comes to your head? You're like, I want to say the program, but you know, like I'm, my girlfriend's kicking kick me out. I'm having this problem. You're like, do you have my other stuff or you just like refer to other resources? Um, say that again. Like, so, so like someone comes to you during your program. Hey, Dirk, you know, I like the program, but I'm doing my girlfriend. She's kicking me out. I'd be homeless or like, you know, I'm having a mental health issue or like I, I, I'm drug free, but man, I really want to do some meth right now. Like, like oh. do you like refer to something else or? Yeah, we, ha we haven't had situations like that, but the closest we had was one of our great students. He was on the inside. He was like getting straight A's and everything. And then just one day he's like, hey, uh, I'm going to take a pause on my education. Why don't you just give the opportunity to somebody else? Mm -hmm. And we don't know what that really meant. I was trying to crack the code because, you know, after working with this guy for a few years, you're pretty friendly with him. And you're trying to figure out, what do you mean you want to stop your education right now? What What's going on? I mean, you know, it had, to be cold, it had to be cold for something. Yeah, it's like, you know, prisoners have mental health issues. They have all sorts of family issues. Like there are all sorts of reasons that something could be going on. And I never figured it out. Um, he just didn't want to go to school anymore. Here's one for you. So not, not only for prisoners, but does everyone deserve a second chance? Is, or is there something some people could do like, man, you, you get no second chance at all? Or does everyone deserve a second chance? This is, this is funny. So like, uh, so... The short answer is, yeah, I think everyone gets a second chance. I mean, how many chances have I had? It's not two. 
<laughs> I mean, if you think back in your, your own personal history, I, I know mine, what am I like the 50th chance? I mean, I, people give me, you know, growing up, I was always doing stupid things. I was always getting extra chances. Maybe, maybe they should have cracked me harder, but I don't think so. I mean, I got punished as a kid and I did stupid stuff anyways. So, and that's a really a nod to my dad that like after all of the, the, the poor decisions I made over time, and I get to, finally I get to prison, and you think he'd just be done. Like, like <laughs> this kid, he's just done too much. And then still, he's still, you know, he's still my father. And he's like, ah, I'll pay for the tuition. I mean, it didn't come easy, but, you know. Can you kind of talk about that a little bit? Like how, how your dad's support meant so much to you? How like really could like, your dad always supporting you? Through, even though he didn't talk for a while, I'm sure he's going to love you and like still supporting you from afar. You probably made a constant decision, like break relationship thing that, that might be better for you. You talking about reconnecting and how that support would like help turn your life around a little bit. Yeah, sure. And it's kind of funny because we like we had an interesting relationship because when I was growing up, I was really a mama's boy, and then my dad was, you know, we didn't really, we didn't really gel as like a father and a son. So like I was really closer with my mom. My dad was, we just didn't have common interests. Um, so it wasn't like we we're playing baseball together, or riding with dirt bikes. All, all my interests were different than his. Um, and then my mom passed away, or she was actually killed in a car. She got hit by a car and when I was a junior in high school. So once my mom was out of the picture, then like this whole new relationship happened with my dad. It was like, oh, hey, I think you're my dad. <laughs> uh, I, thought I, I thought I saw you in the kitchen earlier. What, what's going on? <laughs> so like, like that whole relationship, like we really didn't have a relationship. And then once my mom died, um, they were trying to create something out of whole cloth, which is just weird and awkward, and it didn't really work. I mean, it, it was not like we became buddies after that. Like, you know, it was still a strange, just weird, you know? <laughs> and then, but he was always supportive in some kind of way. Um, and, that, and then, like, you had this really sh sh shaky, odd relationship all through my 20s. And then... And that couple nays of me going to prison. So just for the fact that after all that weird stuff. And are you the only kid? No, I have a brother too. But older, younger? Uh, two years older, and he chose a different path. He went to the Marine Corps, and then became an officer in the Coast Guard. And my dad was ex-military too, so I think they, they shared the military thing. So it's off subject. Isn't it funny, like, a lot of people say, you know, you know, like, if you're in a family, everyone comes out the same. Like, I know, oh. like, I, like, I know one family from growing up, like, those five kids, two are, like, you know, businessmen. Two are like in prison now, and like all five are like different paths, and nothing was the same, right? You're like they're raised by the same parents, but like one is like basically a one is ba honestly like someone is like a terrible person, right? I mean, just yeah. a just a basic thug criminal. Other one who you're the back off the, you know, straight off their back is like a millionaire. Yeah. It's just right? but it's like unexplainable. Yeah, yeah, and that's why I think those psychology classes were so fascinating to me when you when you like like try to, you know. The unexamined life isn't worth living. Like when you try to understand how the hell did I end up here? And you try to understand what makes yourself tick. And part of that conversation in your head is we had basically the same environment, right? And my brother went this way. I went the completely other way. So like it wasn't like I came from a broke, I mean, it wasn't really a broken home. My mom, you know, by the time she died, it was like I had a great time. I mean, we didn't, we were low. Middle class. Like, yeah, we I mean, it wasn't like you. I mean, it, you might not have been eating rib steaks every night, but you're like, we well, won't miss a meal. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm guessing you won't get beat the shit a bit <laughs> you on a daily basis. You know. Yeah, there's there's nothing you could put your finger on. Like, oh, this explains why. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, environmental factors do make a role, make a play. I'm sure. Maybe if I had a shittier, hot child, like, if my childhood was even shittier, I'd just be meaner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, but. I had I had nothing in my childhood or upbringing to explain why I went off the deep end, other than like I mentioned my, my adrenaline addiction. Yeah. And maybe and I actually tried to join the Marine Corps too because I, I kind of figured that out in high school, what made me tick. And it's like I need to I need to blow shit up and shoot things because that's that's the Marine Corps way. Yeah, for you. it's like I'll I'll go to do stupid things on the right side of the law and I'll get yeah. a medal for it, as opposed to a felony. Um, but that didn't work out. So I tried to self-select and do the right line of work. So on your website, it says something about, I don't remember what it said, but like for every dollar someone puts in, they get $20 back. 
you talk about how you get those numbers and stuff? Yeah, that came from the, that was a, the current number, or the last number I've read is every dollar invested returns 1976 back to society. And that's from the Washington State Institute for Public Policy. And so they, and this is actually uh, dollar saved versus value added. So what they did is, it's kind of like a, a I'm a, okay, I'm, I'm not going to talk shit about their data because like, we, we did that later, earlier. Um, but basically, they kind of figure out how much it costs to put somebody in prison. And if you didn't do that, how much are you going to save? So, th so the 1976 includes victim costs, policing costs, criminal justice costs, future prison construction, and incarceration costs. So all of those costs added together, if you keep that person from coming back to prison, you save all that money. And that's kind of where like social impact bonds come into play in, in this financial picture, is you, if you invest these things, then that's a huge return on investments. And how do you capture that money? Um, that's a different conversation. That's a whole thing about finance. But for the state, the state wants to save that 1976. Like, okay, let's invest this money now because the payoff is great. And the taxpayers save all this money. Um, what they don't calculate is the value added. Let, let's say, let's say that one person doesn't come back to prison and you save 1976 over the long term. What you, you're not adding up is the value added. Like if he's working and paying taxes, there's money for the state. Maybe he starts a business. Maybe he hires 30 people. That's money for the state. Maybe he does all these great things. Or maybe he just works at Walmart and just pays payroll taxes. I mean, even just not coming back to prison on the base level, that's a value add for the state. Or there's, you know, if, and my idea is if we have this really great educational program, instead of him just not reoffending, maybe we put rocket fuel on, on his future trajectory. And then maybe he does get out and starts a business and hires 30 people. And then what, is, what does that value add look like? And even taking those numbers off the table, they're both not coming to prison and you're still saving 1976. Um, the Rand Corporation did a similar study and they were more conservative in their analysis. Their analysis, you save about every dollar invested, saves about five bucks. Um, they're, but they're, they're, they're super conservative. Yeah, they're super conservative. Yeah, yeah, they're conservative group, yeah. Um, so I think they had less numbers in there. So how do you fix this? Or does it even be fixed? Like, you know, like stereotypically, like you're a felon, you get out, you apply for a job, you got to put on there, you're a felon, right? And you know, some people say, well, you know, you already saved your time. Why do you have to keep putting that on there? I don't know. Some states have to ban the box thing, you know? And, and don't be wrong, like, you know, like you, if you have a company and it's like 80% female, that guy's applying, he's like, you know, sex assaulted 10 females, he went to jail for that, you know, he kind of, you know, want to protect your employees too, right? But then it has to be some kind of balance, I think, you know? Yeah, for example, like if you have a, if you have a sex crime, you don't want to hire them for daycare. Mm -hmm. Or if you have a financial crime, maybe you don't want to hire them for your, your hedge fund. But the funny story about this is this comes up uh, when I talk to like, sometimes I'll talk to like chamber of commerces or business groups. Um, about 30 years ago, the White House did a study. I think it was just basically called Crime in America. They're trying to, they're trying to understand the prevalence of crime in our nation separate from conviction rates. And so they, they did a, a survey of Americans, and these are people that, that are responding presumably honestly. And they said, you know, have you do ever done anything that might have been a felony? And as it turns out, 91% of Americans yeah. have admitted doing something. It could be drunk driving, it could be a bar fight, it could be cocaine at the clubs, you know, all of those things. It could are be felony. going to 125 and a 50 mile speed limit. I mean, there's a lot of felonies you can get. That's do a felony. There, you know? I'm, I'm, you know, I may be guilty of one of those. <laughs> so all of these things are actual felonies, and that's legit. You get the felony, you're fucked. And like, you know, once you get your felony, either you pay a fine, do some jail time, do prison time. The study classified it that the felonies they were screening were serious enough that you actually had to do prison time as opposed to just jail time or fine. So the 91% of people that admitted to doing some kind of felony, those are kind of the serious felonies. So when I talked to these business groups, I was like, look, you know, you think you're screening for these legitimate reasons and you're not going to hire somebody that has a felony, but you need to understand- The person you hired actually did a felony. He just didn't get caught. Yeah, it's like 91% of your workforce is a potential felon. They just didn't get caught or they had the money get out of it or they had you know, white privilege or whatever, however you want to call it. They, they escaped that conviction. 
Um, but still, 91% of your workforce could have been a felon. And the ones you're not hiring are the ones that got caught. But at least you know what they did. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like the 91% of your workforce, they could be sex offenders. They could be they could be stealing pennies from the the. the I mean, you think about it. Like you're driving on I five every day, like. How many people are probably, even at four in the afternoon, how many people are like on drugs or drunk? <laughs> how many people are not using a trick single or like speeding or whatever, you know? Yeah. Doing just different crimes. And, and that's kind of like when you allude to like the the man the box comes into play. And that's not really perfect either because the premise behind it is if you take the box off the application form, that's not going to scare somebody away from applying. But and you're still going to ask them later on. Yeah, you're going to ask them later on. And like that's why it sounds like it's a good idea. And the funny thing is, I was when I sometimes I go to the Google Lunch and Learns where I talk about our Prison Scholar Fund and we get volunteers and, and support from Google. I did one down in Mountain View, California. And just before I did my talk, the woman before me was their director of equity and inclusion or the director of some of their one of their HR ladies. So she had a whole hour long talk about how Google has banned the box. So as she as soon as she got done talking, I ran up to her I was like, "Hey, I'm I'm on I'm on in five minutes. That's fucking great what you guys are doing. But tell me, you're you're Google. You don't need the box. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, for real, you're gonna find out what they did anyways. The real question is, how many felons are you guys hiring? Yeah, that's good. Question. And then she's like, "Oh, let me get back to you." And yeah, then, and then of she course, goes to me. Of course, of course. It's like so banning the box sounds like a good idea because you're you're not dissuading people from the criminal record from applying. You go, "Hey, they're not asking me if I'm a felon. I got a shot." But on the back end, the business can still turn you down if there's a legitimate business reason for not hiring you as a felon, like we mentioned, sex offenders in the daycare, yeah. financial crimes in the bank. But you can cook up any pretty pretty much yeah. business reason, like, oh, it's it's not a good fit for our culture. It's like And plus I think you have context too, like, you know, I, you know, I'll probably get slammed for this, but like if someone applies for a job with me and 15 years ago they like killed three people in a DUI accident. Okay, that's bad and all, but it's 15 years ago, you know. Versus someone like had three DUIs within six months. Okay, dude, like where, where's your judgment at, right? Yeah, it's such a complicated issue. I think, you know, like, especially with our coding boot camp, so, like part of our job is we, we get them the training. We, we show them how to be a computer engineer. The other part of our job is to find employees that might hire them. And we're not looking for the band the box. We want to be straight up. It's like, look, we got a guy. He's going to be a badass coder. And here's, here's all the stuff he's going to learn when he graduates. Will you give him a shot? Like, we're not looking for a yes, but we're looking for a maybe. Like, would you hire a person, criminal record, whether they have one or not, if they know these skills, do you have the need for this person? And it takes a lot of work to find that maybe. Yeah. But that's what we're looking for. And you know, some of the, you know, some of the, the companies are like, we, we need, we need talent. But not that type of talent, at least. Saying. No, I, I'm on the other side. Like, okay. We need that talent. Yeah. yeah, we'll give them a shot. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's great. Talk about your partnership with the Puget Law Group. What do they do for y'all? What do you do for them? Oh, that's, a, that's actually a new, a new partnership. And it's really cool because that's our very first paid uh, sponsorship. Um, so we have like a, a page on our website. I, mean, I know they're like one of the well, more well-known law groups in Tacoma, I think, aren't they? Okay. Yeah, I think they're based in Seattle. Is it just in Tacoma? I think Seattle's Tacoma, yeah. yeah. Um, so on our, on our partner page, we can basically have all our, all our nonprofit partners that add value in some way, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, um, some other people that help us with whatever we do. And then just one day, they, it wasn't them that reached out. It was one of their placement agencies. They're like, hey, how much would you charge for uh, a little logo and a link to our website and a little a little blurb on your website. I was like, <laughs> then the negotiation began. It's like, I had no idea. I had no idea. So I probably totally underbid it. So I, I tried to play, like, play smart with it. I was like, I oh, know, what's it worth to you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we, what's, we, your, what's your budget? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and since it's going through a third party, they're probably peeling off some of the money. Um, but yeah, it's cool. Our very first placement, they're, they're in a, I did a little bit of research on them. They seem like they're a legitimate law firm. They're good size. And uh, so sure, we'll help them do some marketing and nice. So yeah. what so what were some challenges of running a nonprofit? <laughs> Everything. Uh, um I mean, of course, my job is really, you know, raising money and, and vision and mission. Um 
but since we're a very small organization, that means everything like dishwasher, emptying the garbage cans. And as you know, and we're getting a little bit bigger because we've been getting some new grants, but that means we have to scale up and hire staff. And these grants don't like, don't like, are they like 10 year grants that like get to like, get the funding every single year, like a continuing process. Yeah. We got some government grants, which were like brand new for us. And then, yeah, you're, so I'm always reapplying for funding, always trying to find money. Um, you know, like this podcast is an example, like my role is really to share the excitement of the mission of what we do and let people know what we do. And maybe somebody hears about us and goes, oh, that's that's exactly what I want to fund. And are you only still in the state of Washington or you're nationwide yet? Uh, yeah, we're, we're, we've we always been nationwide. We were, in, we were in 24 states when we did the post-secondary work. And then we scaled some of that back to like the West Coast because some of the funders only wanted to fund territorially. And then with our boot camp, Initially, our boot camp was just in Washington, but now we just brought on our very first prison uh, boot camp prison scholar in Virginia because uh, Coding Dojo is a national organization. We were initially focusing in locally just because it might be easier to build employment contracts, but a lot of the a lot of the tech works remote anyways. So he's our very first non-local person. So we'll see how that works out. And there is so. Do you have any expansion plans? Yeah, we you know we'd love to do more of everything, but all that takes is money. Is there any degree program that you don't allow the people to get? No, full student agency. We, we like our we existed because we we're like a replacement of the Pell Grant, and like if you get the Pell Grant, they don't screen what your degree is, so you learn whatever you want. That's true. And so how many people are like, I guess, is the term graduate from your program the right term? Yeah, I think we had around about, about, about 100 people. 100 people? Give or take. And do they all keep in touch with y'all or like this yeah. goes on way or? Yeah, yeah. Just, or just like a regular college, they graduate, that they, they were the full they, wins. Exactly. And that's why we had those, you know, the first UW interns spending, you know, almost a year cyber stalking. Like we just got to find them. But I mean, some people are so thankful for what we do. We, we, we form a really strong relationship. And some of the people are just near the wind. Has anyone like, you know, did your program, been successful, you know, what that, what that means, right? And like, like gave your money back? Some of them, yeah, okay. for sure. I mean, because my job is raising money, I'd always like to see more money coming back. Mm -hmm. But like, I know one of our guys, he got out, he's made like 200 grand a year. And uh, I'm like, hey, you know, kick down a little bit, brother. <laughs> I mean, he does, he, make, mm -hmm. he makes a contribution, but. It, the, the biggest thing is to see them do really well. Yeah. And then we'll get, you know, it's almost like if you're running a food bank and then you give people food, and it, it'd be great when they're on their feet. Mm -hmm. And if they gave you money, if they remembered that yeah. you fed them and they gave you money, that's cool. But you, there's not, not really the expectation to get money from your clients. Yeah. So in your mind, how do y'all, how do how are y'all successful? Yeah, we, success is really measured in the success of our students. Okay, hundred percent. And so I guess the opposite would be true. As I ask you, how do y'all fail? Yeah, it's like if we're if we're ineffective making any kind of like you know the world the world changer argument, because I'm not changing anybody's world, then I'm in the wrong business. Like, what am I doing? Am I just getting a job at Home Depot and sell hammers? So, what if I actually ask someone who's going to think about starting a nonprofit? <laughs> uh, people ask me that all the time, and. I just try to tell them not to. Um, it is probably a nonprofit that exists already that does that. Yeah, like like not to cut you off, but I know in the, in the military, right? It was like make these numbers like, like five hundred thousand better nonprofits. Like down the down to Fort Lewis, it was actually I know for a fact there's like four nonprofits for fishing, right? Now of course like ones like DC fishing, ones like fishing the river, ones like fly fishing, <laughs> but you all fishing just join forces and make one great nonprofit, right? But no. Yeah, it's like, I, I think what happens, and it, I get this, before people in prison, like, because not everyone knew I started a nonprofit, um, but you'd always hear on the news, these nonprofits, they get, get in trouble for misappropriation of funds, and we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars. So, remember, when I, when I was talking about nonprofits, and somebody told me I should start one, I had no idea what the fucking nonprofit was. And so, I had to learn what it even was in the first place. And so, what I think happens, especially with the prisoners, is they see all this news about nonprofits scamming, doing all these scams and yeah. misappropriating money. And they're like, oh, there's money in nonprofits. Yeah. Maybe I should start a nonprofit. Um, but that's not really how it goes. Um, 
so if you have something unique, if you like, there's a, a gap in a, in a program services that you could really fill, then go for it. But it's a lot harder. It's not just a matter of hanging your shingle and then all this money's going to go yeah. out the door. Yeah, no, right. Some people think it's like your fundraiser for a startup. You're not going to be a millionaire in six months. It's a, a process. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, I see that a lot too, is especially with some people coming out of prison, like the nonprofit thing aside, they're like, oh, when I get out of prison, I'm, I'm going to be a business owner. And so they know enough to like, maybe they'll take a couple of business classes. They'll get their LLC. They have an idea for a company and they figure out once you know, once you got your LLC and a business license, you're a business owner, <laughs> but there's a difference between being a business owner yeah. on paper and the hustle and yeah. drive it takes to actually do it. And so they, they get out of prison and they're like, oh, I'm a business owner, but nobody's buying anything I have to sell because they don't have any ideas. No. So suppose there's a company out there and they need to hire someone, right? Why should they hire one of your people? Because they're talented. I mean, the only different part is the criminal record part. Um, we're not, we're, and that's like, we're not like a, uh, I don't know if affirmative action is the right word. We're not saying hire one of our people because he's formerly incarcerated and he's coming with a, a lower skill set. We're basically saying hire him because he's equally qualified, if not better. And oh, by the way, he's also formerly incarcerated. And a good example of that is most of our students in the coding dojo, uh, they get graded on their exams. So they, they do it like they call their students ninjas, you know, coding dojo ninjas. And they're they're graded on belts, just like your little karate belts. You got you know white belt, yellow belt, red belt, like and black belt's the pinnacle. Some of our students, like that guy that they got the hundred thousand dollar contract, he got black belts on all of his, his exams, which is like unheard of at Cody Dojo. Nobody does that. But our guys are so badass, they're getting black belts on all the exams, which kind of translates to he's probably going to do pretty well in your company. So we're not asking like, hey hire our people who barely pass this material. These guys are hungry. They're savages. <laughs> They're going to do a good job. Yeah. Oh, and, and then by the way, they also got a conviction for doing something stupid. Yeah. Which 91% of your workforce probably already has. <laughs> yeah. Does this, like, suppose, like, you know, if someone does something bad at 21, they do 20 years, they got at 41. Does the fact that it was 20 years ago ever, like, help them get a job? They know, it's, not, it's not like a, hey, Three years ago, this was like 20 years ago. Or is it still like a detriment? Maybe. Like, I know that, like, depends on what kind of background check is done. Like, if you do the FBI background check or the state patrol background check, it's going to come up. But I think most companies do these private background check mechanisms that they only go back like seven years. So, like me, if you did a background check on me through one of those paid services, I'm clean. You're a Boy Scout. Yeah, it's like, it's funny, too, because, like, I did so much time in a prison the, the moment I walked out of prison, I would have come back clean because if it only goes back seven years, and I've done 15 years in prison. I literally just that's, walked out the prison yard. That's, that's fine. <laughs> um, but I think it's like maybe a financial institution or a bank. They're going to, because the state patrol background checks are more expensive. And it's like cost benefit analysis, right? So that they're probably going to do the more robust background check versus trying to get a job at Domino's Pizza. They're like. <laughs> and how many people work at your organization right now? Uh Five. 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 And they've been with you for, for a long time or? No, some of them are kind of new because we got more funding for the food program. So we have food people. We got more funding for our digital equity in our Cody Bootcamp program. Um, mostly it's really been just me, a single paid employee up until maybe two, three years ago. And, and then, then we just had a whole bunch of volunteers. And what type of people do you look to come work for you? Like any certain type of characteristics, any certain type of values, or I mean, of course they got to believe in your mission, of course. But yeah, I think believing the mission kind of has the values built in. Mm -hmm. Um you know, it really depends what the role is. You know, if we're if we're doing the food delivery stuff or the you know, that kind of stuff, just motivate like everything can kind of be trainable, yeah. except the personality of you know, accountability. You know, do what you say you're going to do. And we're kind of, uh, there's a lot of autonomy for the employees that we work with. So when it when it doesn't work is if you give somebody a job to do, they understand the job, like how much, how much management do they need? Like the best situation is when they're self-directed people. Um, because I'm so busy with all my other stuff. It's like, and we don't have layers of management. So like 
I don't have time to do everything I'm doing and then manage our, our small staff. It's, it's best when, you know, they can really work. And I, I'm probably a terrible manager here, but if they can kind of work independently, all they need to do is, all they need to know is figure it, you know, know what the job is. I'll communicate that and then just figure it out. And that's a different, that's a different personality than, you know, three months of training and daily management. And cause we don't really have an office anymore. We're, we're, we're all, we shut down our office during COVID. So we're, we're all remote. So you can almost translate to the UW interns cause they're, they're kind of brand new to the workforce. They don't have a whole lot of that autonomous personality, but it worked really well because I had the, the office in Ballard. I had a bunch of, you know, five or six people in our office and there's a whole lot of internal management. But when you work remotely, it's really hard to manage people remotely unless you need butts and seats. Like you can really monitor them. You know, are you doing everything the right way? Um, and that's not one of my strengths in management. So I'm, I'm working on to be a better manager. And how many people are, are, are in the prison scholars program right now? We don't have that many students anymore. COVID really hit that. So we probably about 30 total. So those 30 total, of course, no, some did probably horrible things, some not so bad, but did different things. How do you, how do you like separate that stuff from your personal life? How do you like not get too involved in them, so to speak, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I guess I'm just, uh, just compartmentalize it, I guess. Okay, that's a good word. And then, um, so remote work. What do you do to make sure that people hired can actually do remote work? I'm a big believer everyone can't do remote work. You got to have some kind of discipline, some kind of drive. Like, I mean, eventually you got to get out of your pajamas, right? And, you know, get out of bed and turn on the computer, right? Yeah. And I don't know the answer to that. Um, remote work for me and our organization has not been great. Um, other companies love it. Um, you hear about Google and Facebook and Amazon bringing people back to the office. Um, they might have to do more less with productivity and more with other reasons. And I think that has to do with real estate issues because like they have all these buildings that are unoccupied. And they're like, hey man, we, we should put people in them so we don't feel like we're losing money. Because I think they hire such high caliber people. And I think they're better with the management part of it. Because just recently I, I was mentioning that like I noticed our remote work wasn't working. So I had a, one of my mentors at, at Dropbox I'm like, hey, how do you guys do your remote work? How, do, how does it work for you? And they have a whole lot of management. They basically do um, daily stand up, stand up meetings at like nine in the morning for like maybe 15, 20 minutes. So it's, there, there still is management involved. It's just they're really, really smart with their KPIs and their deliverables. And it's just a different management process. And that's something that I haven't been doing very well. So I'll take ownership of I need to be a better remote manager if I'm going to do that. If not, we got to get people in the office and you can you know, just work with them better. So earlier we talked about people like going back to prison, you know, based on, you know, going back to the same environment. But what other reasons do you think there is that people go back to prison? <laughs> I don't know. Um, Everything's a decision, really. I mean, yeah, if it's, it's, you know, I don't know. There's probably drug addiction is a big one. Uh, that one ever guy I knew, you know, that was a social thing that he couldn't detach himself from. I'm sure greed's one, like, you know, greed's what got me to prison. So maybe people get out. And I think I saw this one of our guys, he wanted to do the boot camp initially, and we did not select him. Cause like the moment, it's like the moment he got out of prison, uh, it, it seemed like, what happens is after like you've lost 10 years of your life, you're trying to catch up. So like what it was important to him at that moment was fancy watch, nice clothes, getting a fancy car. And, but that's the same kind of path that's going to lead you to prison. Um, Cause you want all of these things before you can really earn them. Um, it's, and that's the, the most disheartening thing about prison is like, let's say you commit a crime and you got to do 15 years. So you do 15 years, and when you get out, you're basically right back as, as square zero. So you have to build your whole life from nothing again. And then the more time that goes by, the harder that, or like the most social, more socially awkward that is. Like if you get out of prison when you're 40 or 50, at that point, you should have a really great career or like you should have been, in, you know, had 30 years of employment. 
maybe you got a house, maybe you got a car, wife, kids, whatever. You have all these things that are kind of expected of you in society. Now, I know not, not everyone in society has house and cars and kids, but you know, you might be looking at that metric as that's where you should be, and you realize you got zero. And so either that motivation is going to get you to work really hard and get there, or you're going to start selling drugs or like, you know, try to make that shortcut, which might be what got you to prison in the first place. Can you talk about some of the companies or organizations that you get funding from? Um, yeah, most of them are uh, nonprofits. So we got the foundation we get funding from. Um, let's see. We still get money from the, the, the Myers Foundation there in Chicago. Um, a great one was uh, Milgard there in Tacoma. They gave us money for a van or partially money for a, tra a, a trailer for food. Um, we got some money from the Commerce Department. That's for a digital equity program. We got money from the city of Seattle, and that was for our technology matching fund. And that's uh, our digital equity program. And that basically teaches computer basics. But as we're teaching computer basics, we find out who in that class has the aptitude and we put them in the coding boot camp. Of course, Coding Dojo is a big supporter because they give us slots in their coding boot camp for free. Those slots are worth $17,000. So they're giving us a $17,000 scholarship that we in turn turn over the, the applicant. Hope they do well because they're getting trained really, really great. Yes. So how, how does this work? Like, let me put this question. Oh, I should also throw a couple of in from Microsoft and Google because okay. not only not only do they match the contributions from the employees when they give us a cash gift, but each volunteer, whenever they work an hour for us, the company pays. So like oh, wow. okay. if a Googler works, we get 10 bucks from Google. So if a Google volunteer is for one hour, we get 10 bucks, 10 hours, hundred bucks. Microsoft's 25 bucks an hour. So what you really want is all these volunteers from Microsoft and Google <laughs> just working, <laughs> just give them stuff to do. And then uh, before you know it, it pays the rent. And so how do you take care of yourself, either mentally or physically, uh, <laughs> to make you don't burn out, all that kind of stuff? Yeah, it's, it's funny. Um, years ago, you know, they're talking about CEO burnout and all that stuff. And I thought, ah, what a bunch of pussies. <laughs> and, and then after, you know, five years of doing this, you're like, you know, there's something to do that. <laughs> so I think that's where the motorcycle riding comes in. Um, I try to, I try to have work-life balance, whatever that means, and, you know, do stuff that's it's so hard though because when you run your own company you're on 24 7. yeah i'm answering emails at four in the morning you know our digital equity manager you know he has like nighttime hours so he's asking me questions at one in the morning um so it's really hard to really turn that off because you know the prison scholar funds like my baby so it's like i really want it to succeed um the hard it's the funny thing is i try to like actually have a discrete moment of time i'm like i'm going to go on a vacation for a week that's I fucking mean it. I'm going to go on a vacation for a week. No prison scholar fund activity. 100% vacation. I'm going to the beach in Belize. And then two weeks, you know, maybe a week before my vacation, an RFP goes out. I was like, ah, fuck, the due date. <laughs> the due date is in the middle of my vacation. And this thing's for 500 grand. Yeah. Guess what's going to happen? I, yeah. I'm, I'm writing, well, working vacation. I'm writing that grant from the beach, <laughs> from the beach in Belize with a with a margarita how often do you, do you ask that guy you do public speaking to talk about what you're doing i should do it more because that's really my my job but i'm an introvert so this is perfect for me like one-on-one -on -one and stuff um i don't know if you must saw my video for so the social venture partner I think I did, yeah. the funniest thing about that video is if the readers ever go and watch it um it's on my website i'm, I'm really proud of it because it's a kind of like a ted talk and i won first place i got 20 grand and when you watch the video it's really good. I, I like like a really professional TED Talk public speaker. What you don't know is I practiced that thing 300 or 400 <laughs> times. I swear to God. I was in Ballard. I was, I was talking to my cats. Um, I even had professional coaches. I mean, I went through this thing so many times. My best coach, he worked at Point B Capital, and he would take me to his office, and I would pitch his, his staff. Um, but I'm a feedback junkie. So it's really funny. Like I would, I would pitch his, his staff and these are like professional pre presenters for you know, the startup communities and they would go, okay, Oh, we love it. Oh, it's, that was perfect. We love it. I says, okay, tell me everything you hate about it. 
And that's where the real magic happens. They look around. Well, I don't yeah. maybe this. Yeah. And if you know, everyone has a hand, both hands yeah, right yeah. up. There's that one thing. There's, oh, you know, you could have done this differently. And that's where you improve. Because, you know, people, I think, kind of people and nice people, you want to say nice things. Mm -hmm. But that's not valuable. It's like, if you want to improve your pitch, tell me, <laughs> tell me everything that fucking sucked. Yeah. And then, so I did that, you know, I practiced that thing for, for months. And then when I got on stage, I look like I know what I'm doing, but inside my head, I was fucking terrified. I was completely like frozen, but my body was still working. I was just like, ah, but what, what saved me was that those 300 or 400 practice sessions, the, I just, the muscle memory, I just went, yeah, I went autopilot muscle memory. Yeah. I just like, I know this and I, I just spit it out. I mean, like everyone knows like Steve Jobs give like great presentation. People don't know like, it ain't like he just walked up to talk about, he was like, he would like make a hundred Apple employees come at eight o'clock at night and listen to him. Right. <laughs> give me your room feedback. He was like practice, practice, practice. Like everything's yeah. rehearsed. And I don't know. I don't know what his process was. And I, and some people are, are natural. They're extroverts. They get their energy from the crowd. They get the energy from that. I don't get my energy from that. Like that's hard work for me. That's really, really tough. Um, but which is kind of funny because as, as the CEO of the organization, I should do more of that. My job is to get out and share our mission, talk to people, talk to organizations, department of conferences, because what we do makes sense. It's like, okay, so here's a funny story. I, I did this Republican di dinner once and uh, I sat at this like junior Republican table. And of course, when everyone's sharing what they do, they like, they're all senators. And they're like, oh, what do you do? I was like, I direct the Prison Scholar Fund. And, like, and then you had that conversation like, so you're saying that uh, my, my daughter should go to prison if she wants a college education, <laughs> that, whole, that whole thing. Yeah. It's like, well, if your daughter is poor, she gets it anyway, she gets a Pell Grant. We're not taking anything from your daughter. Um, and, and then the great part of that was like, you know, when I was saying our mission makes sense, I was like, look, even if you hate people, <laughs> they, they perk up a little bit like even if you hate people it saves you money putting them in prison i mean putting putting them in uh, education programs because you already mentioned the 68 percent recidivism rate that's a three-year mark in three years 68 percent get rearrested in five years it's 78 72 percent i might have the numbers a little bit wrong but after nine years the recidivism rate is 83 percent so look, however you feel about prisoners, within nine years, 83% of them, I know that number for sure, 83% of them are getting rearrested. So if you want to stop that, education is a great tool. Like the recidivism rates drop by, you know, uh, we have the, I think it's 68%. No, there, there's a different number for the, uh, I can't remember. But anyways, no matter, even if you hate people, you save a lot of money and 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 that's that's true is spend that money somewhere else yes so you're talking about your organization some can, can you go to more detail about more detail like in depth of how it got started what you focus on now what you're like vision is it for the future sure yeah when we when we first started um you want to try another one sure which one you want to try surprise me i'll um, let you pick you try both. You have both. Sure. Yeah, I'll give that a shot. Yeah. So when we first started, we were basically the supplement or the uh, filling in the gap for the Pell Grant. So the Pell Grant was, you know, I mentioned was taken away in '94. Three hundred and fifty-seven college prison programs dropped about eight. So if you're in prison, you know, and you want to change your life, there's not too many opportunities. Oh, cheers. Oh, I like that smooth. So we we stepped in to fill the gap of where the Pell Grant shouldn't be for prisoners. And then when I got out of prison, I went to DC three times to basically lobby Congress. Uh, okay, so first of all, nonprofits can't do like formal lobbying, or they can just a small percentage. So you really just call it educating. So I think no more than twenty percent of your budget can be spent lobbying. Um, and of course, we use less than that. But so we went to Congress for three times, just sharing my personal story, some of the anecdotes I told you, like, you know, when we talked to the, some of the conservatives, look, even if you hate people, you're saving a lot of money. And then that's why there's bipartisan support for prisoner education. And in 2021, the Pell Grant came back. 
Now we can't tr take credit for that, of course, because like we were one voice in thousands of people with a unified me message to Congress saying, look, taking education away from prisoners is not a good idea <laughs> for, for all the reasons that make sense. And you have bipartisan support, you know, the conservatives, the Repu Republicans, they want to save money. Um, the other people, the Democrats, they're, they're more into social programs and they all make sense. It's, it's a great thing to do because it saves you money, it's cost effective and it makes sense and it's program effective. Um, that said, now that the Pell Grant has come back to prisoners in some aspect, it's not super widespread. It's like not every prison has a, a program that qualifies because before kind of almost anything would, would work. Because remember it's taken away in 94 where you had a whole bunch of paper-based distance education programs. You just had all sorts of random things. And now when it comes back, the college has had like a footprint in the, in the prison and there's a whole bunch of little criteria for how, how, how it can come back. The downside of that is some of the prison programs that are already in existence doesn't mean they're great. And of course, you're taking away the student agency where we talked about earlier, like, great, now I can get the Pell Grant and now I can get that liberal arts degree as opposed to maybe, maybe you want to get a business degree or an engineering degree, but those programs aren't in your prison and you can't do a distance education program because that distance education program is not doesn't fall under the approved programs for the new Pell Grants, if that makes sense. So we still have the, some kind of role into helping people change their lives. And what's your future like big time preacher vision? Like everything goes right for you. You're like, you know, you're in every prison in the United States. The citizen rate goes down to 2% or something. Like what's your like, you're like fantasy goal, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, it's really, it's really hard to visualize that because I mean, even even with the Pell Grants, like our 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 mission is like our BHAG, our big hairy audacious goal is like we want every prisoner in America to have the opportunity to go to school. And then it's kind of terrifying to say that because like if this really happens, what is our role in this? It's like, okay, uh a couple million people need to go to college. It's like we can do that five people. Yeah, it's like, exactly. it's like it's like how the that's like, a lot of hiring, a lot of yeah. Overstaffing the admin costs. Yeah, it's like, you know, I, I like to think I'm a smart guy, but I'm like the gap from my five person staff to we're gonna need a staff of a hundred or two hundred people to serve that many people. I'm not there yet. It's like I had this vision. I'm not really quite sure how to get there. Um, I guess you just a lot of it's, you know, uh scalable, but still. Um now do y'all do anything like with trade schools? construction workers or plumbers or anything yeah, like that. Yeah, we explored that. And then generally the criteria for the unions is they don't have they don't care about the criminal record. They just want to make sure the person can get there. So the only thing they care about is do they have a driver's license? Mm -hmm. And then it's like, well, but we're in the you know, we're kind of in the post-secondary game, which is increasing like mental capacity mm -hmm. for a different type of work, as opposed to they just want somebody who can show up and swing a hammer and you know dig dig a ditch. Yeah, I remember I saw this on some social media, like, and of course I, I'm guessing it's true, right? They're saying like that, like right now the average construction worker is like 42 years old, and basically broken you know, like for every 50 people leaving in the next 10 years, only five people are taking a place or something crazy like I, that. I wouldn't be surprised if that's true. And of course, all, all the brain talents leaving, you know, they didn't replace people. Don't know what they're going on. So the guy for the day, you like don't buy your house now. Don't buy it in 10 years. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's gonna be built really shitty. One thing I will say though is I just bought some lumber the other day, and uh, I was shocked at how cheap it was. Yeah, some lumber is like really expensive. Well, I mean, it was uh, so pre-COVID lumber was reasonable. And then COVID happened, and then lumber went up like five x, ten x. It went up crazy amounts. So I didn't, and I I wanted to build a shed in my backyard, and so I didn't build the shed. And then just the other day, actually yesterday, I went to graze lumber in Tacoma, and I bought a bunch of lumber I, mean, I bought a lot and then the bill came up it's like 500 bucks i was like, <laughs> like, like okay, i got are this. you kidding me that would have been five grand a year ago easily yeah yeah um so you said you kind of had to like tone down your your program during covid since covid is like i mean it's still around i guess like not as bad has it has the program been picking back up yeah i just mean by by the covid part meaning introducing the programs into the prison was hard because all the education programs were locked down the the inmates were quarantined so it was really hard to actually bring anything into the prison 
And our, our initial partnership with Coding Dojo, I'll tell some of that story. Um, this is actually a great story for our, uh, our my favorite person, my, my uh, chairman of the board. So back in 2016, he was one of our very first UW interns. Um, super smart guy. His name is Sai Nimagata and super badass intern. And I found his currency and his currency were these chocolate covered, I think they were chocolate covered blueberries. <laughs> I, I, would, I would get them from like, I think it was either Trader Joe's or maybe Starbucks had those. So instead of paying them dollars, you pay them a chocolate blueberry. Oh, yeah, I pay them all. Like I find I find out what snacks the insurance like, and I make sure I have them. So he he would uh, he didn't know I knew his game. <laughs> I think I finally told him, but whatever. He was a great intern, super smart. He's a computer science um, student at the UW. He graduated, and over time, he still volunteered with us. And back in 2016, I tried to bring a coding boot camp into the prison. I was going to partner with coding uh, uh, code fellows at that time. And they were on board. Everything was on board. It just didn't work. You know, long story short, it didn't work out. But I think Cy remembered that because over time, he just kept volunteering in just, at, you know, different ways. And then in early in 2021, he's like, he, he wanted to join the board. He's like, I love what you guys do. Think about joining the board. He did. Maybe a year and a half later, he uh, got promoted to the chairman of the board or chairperson, we call him. And around that time, he's like, hey, let's let's revisit that coding boot camp thing. I wonder if we can do that. And so this must have been early 20. No, it was 2020. COVID had already hit. So we talked to coding. Do so what we did is we actually made a list of all the coding boot camps in Seattle. You know, there's eight or 10 people on there or eight or 10 companies on there. Coding Dojo probably alphabetically was the first number we called. <laughs> and we're, we're like a third of the way through our pitch. And then uh, Richard, the CEO, he's like, let's do it. Okay. <laughs> so we had a partnership. And, and at that point, we were going to bring the Coding Dojo into the prison. And we really didn't know how badly locked down they were. So we still haven't brought it into inside the prison. But at that moment... Um, the partnership existed. And then Richard was like, hey, how about, since we can't bring it in at this moment, let's just give you some slots for the external boot camp because they got, during COVID, they went 100% remote. They had they had offices in Bellevue. They shut the, those down. Now their program was 100% remote, which means our students can do it from anywhere. So as soon as they got out of the you know, out of prison, we could drop them right in the boot camp. And uh, there you go. No, you don't do county jails, right? That's to be too logistically impossible. Just this prison is correct. Yeah, county jails are tough because, first of all, you're not convicted yet, and you might get out tomorrow, maybe in two years. It's like there's so many variables, and I mean, we could do some stuff in the county jails, but it, it's just so hard. Now, is there a breakdown between like state prisons and federal prisons? Uh, we we don't really have any federal prisons in Washington. Okay. We have the F FDCC TAC, mm -hmm. which is like a detention center, um, but we do have some federal prisons. In fact, one of our board of directors, uh, Robert Wood, he was in Lompoc when he applied to us. Um, he wrote the most amazing essays. And then, of course, he got funded. <laughs> and then I think he's like, he finally got his bachelor's degree. Now he's, he's, he's working on his, he got his bachelor's degree while he's incarcerated. He's working on his MBA while he's incarcerated. Then he actually had 25 to life for, this is one of those disparities in sentencing. He's a black guy uh, from... San Diego, you know, running gangs in San Diego. And I think he's selling crack. You know, one of those crack cocaine yeah. stories. And so he got sent to like 25 to life for the crack cocaine thing. And then they had the first step to act. And that's actually, a you know, one great thing Trump did is he passed that first step to act. It's really narrow in scope, but it counts for crack cocaine versus regular cocaine sentencing disparities. So old Robert Wood, after... I think he was down for 18 years. He got out, so he didn't have 25 life anymore. He got out. He finished. He's he's still working on his MBA. He joined our board of directors, and um, doing great. Yeah, not top politics, but of course, a lot of people criticize Trump for a lot he deserves. But I don't think he gets credit for like all the criminal justice stuff he did, right? Yeah, it's like it's kind of a a, a too interesting discussion because he did do some things that are highly visible. Like like the first step act. It's like he really likes to like celebrate that one. And like he had all the celebrities on board with that. 
but it's so narrow in scope. It's like only for federal prisoners, only for this really. Oh, that I didn't. I thought it was everyone. I didn't know it was just for federal prisoners. Yeah, it's just federal. I, I did not know that. I mean, I could be wrong. I mean, maybe some of your readers would yell at me, but yeah. um, I think it's only for federal. I don't think it affects. I mean, it kind of makes sense because he, he's the federal president, right? He really can't dictate what happens in the state prisons, you know. Exactly. So, yeah. Yeah, that's probably true. And think what else? Um, so can you talk us through the application process? Like, how does someone apply? What's the whole process look like? Sure, for the either one boot camp or uh, secondary. Either, either one. Oh, oh. Let's yeah. do the, the the regular program first. The, okay, so this here's the bad news. Um, as we're the we're literally the only game in America for post secondary in prison, if you don't want to do liberal arts, and one of the very few prisons that has that program, we're your guy. And and I, I really hate that because we can't fund everybody, and I wish that we could refer people to. Hey, we can't help you but organization XYZ can. There's almost no other scholarship organizations that that do it. I mean, there's a couple, but like I would try to get data from them and like either they don't exist or like, hey, you know, I look at their website, try to, try to track them down. Hey, tell me what you do and how many people you're serving. And, but okay, so every once in a while you hear about some, some organization that kind of supports a prisoner. It's really rare. So, that's a whole prelude to because we're the only organization in America, we get a shitload of mail. Like after our, our conversation here, I'm going to go to Ballard and pick up my mail. I'll probably have 200 letters from people that heard about us. So actually handwritten letters. Like yeah, yeah. Not emails or just yeah, literal letters. letters. Like people, because they're prisoners, they don't have email. Okay. I didn't know that. I yeah. thought they had like, I mean, I'm sure they have a, I thought it was like some kind of like computer bank. They went there and I like get 30 minutes. It's like, you know, get a 30 minute phone call, I got 30 minutes on your computer. Oh, no, not really. And then, there are some things like private, private contractors like JPay, Securus. There's some, there's some like e-messaging systems. Like if you if your sister's in prison, she can get on JPay, send you an email. It costs her twenty five cents to send it or whatever it is. So there's some of that. It's really limited. It's not widespread. And of course, you can't just email. Like I think those contacts have to be approved, and there's like a whole process. So you can't just wake up one morning and you're like, oh, I'm gonna email. King Five News, or I'm going to email the Prison Scholar Fund and ask for an application. And there's a problem with that because what happens is, since they can't email us, sometimes I'll get an email from their mom. And she'll say, oh, Johnny really wants to go to college. Can you send him an application? And my answer is usually no, because <coughs> the mom might want Johnny to go to college. Maybe Johnny doesn't want to go to college. Like if Johnny really so you wanted to. You got to hear from Johnny. So yeah. basically like Johnny has to figure out to get to me. Yeah. And that's one thing I know after 15 years in prison, envelopes are pretty easy to find. <laughs> you know, um, So even if Johnny is poor, you get indigent envelopes. You get like 10 or 20 a month from the prison just to write letters. So no matter what, Johnny can write us a letter. And if Johnny wants to go to college that bad, he can write us a letter because if we do fund you, guess what going to college looks like? Writing letters. <laughs> You're gonna have to write your assignments on paper and mail them to your college. So you can start off by writing a letter because maybe that conversation you had with your mom happened in the visiting room. She's like, Johnny, you need to change your life. And, I know, and he says stuff that like, yeah, you know, I know mom, what I'll, do you wanna I'll, do? I'll do for you, mom. Oh, uh, I wanna go to college. There you go, yeah, it's like. And so, the mom runs with it. Yeah, so so we're looking for the guy that's like, he wants to go to college so badly, you know, he'll pursue every avenue he can find, including writing us a letter. So we those 200, you know, envelopes I'm going to pick up in a minute. Um, those are all these people that heard about us from random sources. And, you know, on our application, we ask them, we have this full application, a couple pages of instructions. And it's basically saying, hey, here's the application. But in order to win this thing, um, you need to have a game plan. You need to explain like what you want to do, and, like all this stuff. So we're not kind of blindly funding people because we have so such li limited funding. We can only pick some of the really great ones. What percentage of people do y'all accept? Like ten percent, fifty percent, two percent? Less than one percent. Less than one percent. Okay. And that's why we really we probably we try not to send out applications until we're ready for them. Um, so what it, what happens is we get all these letters and we don't send them applications until we're ready. They just go they go on going to Salesforce. So we have volunteers that read the letters, we they scan them, put them into Salesforce, which is our CRM, 
And then, you know, for, here's a good example, like the Bannerman Foundation that I mentioned a long time ago, we reapproached them for funding again. And they said, okay, let's, uh, we'll give you 14 grand for four students in Southern California. What do you got? So we run a report from Salesforce. We was like, okay, we, it turns out we had 57 people in Southern California that met, that met their geographic constraints. So those 50, like we write them, we go, hey, here's 57 people. Here's an application. You want to, you know, you want to, <laughs> I think we actually wrote more than 57, but we had 57 applications come back, which is hard because then you have to read 57 applications. Just, I mean, just a four pressure, like pick the four people, right? I mean, like, yeah. I mean, it, just how do you decide that, right? Is this, I mean, yeah, I'm, we, we have, not, I'm, not, I'm not envious of that. And we have a whole group, like we had a, a scholarship committee. Everyone votes independently. We kind of make a spreadsheet and we have like different criteria how we score them. So, you know, and the winners float to the top. So the, the four winners floated to the top of the 57, but that doesn't mean the other 53 couldn't have been great in some other yeah. way. It is, and that's why it's really hard to like, I mean, those four might have been the MVPs. All the 53 were probably like, would have been like great students or would it maybe, you know? Yeah, one of that four, that group I just mentioned, that's the, the only guy I went back to prison for. His name was Tony, Tony Curtis. And he came to like, like he, he's a black guy, came from, you know, the like the stereotypical, not great back, background family. Um, straight A student. And then part of that grant was we bought him textbooks because in California, they had a thing called the, they promise grant that paid for your tuition. Our job was just to buy the textbooks. So it was kind of a small outlay, um, but you know, four students over four years, about 14 grand worth of textbooks. Um, so as it turned out, when we bought this guy, Tony Curtis, a textbook, 20 other people were reading them because what the prison did is they paid for the tuition, but they gave them these five inch e-readers. So I don't know if you, you remember going to college, with textbooks, you highlight things, you dog your pages, you put bookmarks in them. You have this whole 10 pound, 10 pound textbooks you're going to school with. But in California, it wasn't that way. While the tuition is paid for, you're doing your schooling on this five inch e-reader, which is just terrible. But old Tony Curtis, our person scholar, he got textbooks. And he's such a great guy that he shared his textbooks with most of his uh, classmates. Um, and then when he got his AA degree, uh, yeah, AA degree, uh, he was down in, where was he? he was in Centinella, which is right on the border of Mexico. And the Californians, we call that, you know, the California prisoners, we call that Centahela because <laughs> it's 120 degrees in the desert, right next to Mexico. Um, only time I went back and, and I loved it. And he's one of the guys that he got out. I think his salary, because he was such a hustler. He's so, he's so smart, so driven. His, his, salary for second year out was like 159,000. Um, he had like two jobs that he was just killing it. So that's, uh, that's what I'm talking about. You put rocket fuel on a guy yeah. and just watch him go. Have you ever got a letter in, in a, something other than English, like Spanish or Italian or Vietnamese or. Yeah. Yeah. Frequently. Okay. And like, how do you do you have someone like read that for you? Or you have to send it to someone or. Yeah, we have, we have a, a bunch of volunteers and like we're a pretty diverse culture in Seattle and Tacoma. So. Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 amazing. Um, has anyone through your program is actually working for you now? Yeah, or involved some kind of way, either like doing whatever, volunteering or whatever. Absolutely, like volunteers are pretty widespread. Um, David Moore is our director of digital equity, and he's he not only was he a bachelor's degree student, he was one of our very first coding boot camp people. Um, he did so good in the coding boot camp, he got black belts on all of his exams remember the black belt story um he did so good or so he did so well that Ho coding dojo hired him as an instructor the moment he graduated and then of course we hired him immediately to be our digital equity instructor so he was working for coding dojo he's working for us um and now he's the digital equity grant just wound down and we got a grant from the fcc for this uh affordable connectivity program so he, he's leading that program so you mentioned Penn State. What other schools are taking part in your program? Arizona State University is a, uh, I mean, sorry, Adams State University is a big one. Um, Penn State no longer has paper-based courses. Um, we have a list on our website, but that changes every year because that list used to be 40 schools long. 
And then over time, a lot of those schools drop off with their post-secondary or paper-based studies. And it, is the responsibility of the student to apply or do you apply for them? How does that work? Oh, yeah, they apply. And that, that's part of the application process okay. is like, figure out where you want to go, have a plan. Um, part of that app plan is the application process. And so let's say, you know, you know John Crinch applies to Adam State. Does Adam State know that he's part of this prison scholar program or is that totally independent? Yeah, so sometimes it gets... Cr- the wires get crossed like there's a difference between figuring out where you want to go and seeing if you're could qualify mm-hmm. and then sometimes they'll, they'll jump the gun they'll, they'll qualify i mean anyone can apply to a college like yeah. you know out of state unity not super selective mm-hmm. so you can technically be a student or like qualify as a student but some of them will jump the gun and say okay send the bill to the prison scholar fund okay you know before you know we've even so so we'll get their application in, the, in their first uh, tuition bill. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like, wait, 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 wait. Slow wait, down, wait. slow your roll. Yeah, yeah, slow down, homeboy. So do the schools or professor ever reach out to you and say, hey, student X is like duly doing great or student X is not making it? Not really. Like, okay. in order for that to happen, um, sometimes we'll get like, you know, we'll have, uh, we have this enterprise. Um, we'll have a, uh, uh, I want to call it a HIPAA release, but it's really just a, okay, yeah, a, yeah. a release so yeah. that the, this, the educational institution can talk to us. That's pretty rare, though. Now, obviously, you don't have the funds for this, but you ever are able to like, go to people's graduations once in a while? Oh, it's, yeah, whenever we can. Okay. So obviously, yeah. you can't do it every graduation. That'd be like cost prohibitive, all that kind yeah. of stuff. But, but that's, you know, you said what, what's winning. That's winning. Mm-hmm. When you go to the graduation, you see them graduate, see them get a job. And after I graduate, you help them there, like, you know, try to get a job, something like that. Or was like, like, I guess when does your, your role stop? And you're like, Hey, we know what we can do for you. And you got to do everything else on your own. Yeah. I don't know if it ever stops. Like, you know, cause we always want to celebrate their successes. We always want to be involved somehow in their life. If they struggle, we want to help there too. Um, you know, as part of the re-entry program, we have all sorts of things. It could be food, clothing, need a laptop. Um, we haven't really been involved with the rent. That hasn't been much of an issue, but we do with our boot camp, our coding boot camp people. Um, and we really just want to be involved because like, most of them succeed so well that we just want to share the successes. So, so we mainly talk about male, male prisoners, right? Is, is any female prisoner program? Or like what's the percentage male, female? I think percentage is. I'm guessing females are pretty low. Yeah. It's like, you know, females in prison in general are pretty low. Yeah. So I say it's probably about 10%. 10%. Okay. Um, and that's then, higher than I thought it would be the answer to you. The same process, the same everything. Yeah, let's see. Maybe eight percent, but yeah, okay. it's, it's around there someplace. Um, we have one female in our in our coding boot camp right now, Fontella, and they have to kind of like do these little small projects for like as they do go through the boot camp. And she's working with you know these really great mentors, and one of her mentors reported back to me that she uh, she created like a chat function, which is like a pretty it's not like make a static web page and put some images and links on there. Like that's what they're supposed to do. And so she created an actual chat program, which is like amazing. <laughs> so super great. Like that's the kind of caliber of students we have. Yeah. It's like make a web page. Okay, I'll do it. I'll, I'll do something extra. Yeah. Yeah. I, I thought about that. Like, how, how the works the female prisoners. Um, and like, I'm just ignorant of but. There's no such thing as a mixed male female prison. So is there a male prison or female prison, right? Well, there kind of is. Like when I was at FDCC TAC, there were men and women in that facility. We couldn't really mix, but we kind of could. Like we couldn't, our living quarters were not mixed. But if you go to education or you go to chapel or you go to the law library, mm-hmm. they're mixed. Okay. And then I actually had the cell, the window of my cell kind of overlooked a courtyard right into the windows of the ladies' cell. So we, you could learn sign language <laughs> and, and talk, you'd have a girlfriend you could talk to through the window. That's funny. Yeah, super cool. So Dirk, is there anything else I asked you that didn't or anything else you want to talk about? Man, I think we covered a lot. So yeah, did. thanks for the conversation. Yes. Um, so I know you talked about a lot. Can you give us any advice or wisdom or anything you want to talk about? I don't know. I think I'm pretty talked out. Um, 3.30, yeah. So thank you so much for your time. Um, I think we covered a lot of prison scholar fund history. It's great to revisit some of that because I haven't done that in a while. And can you give us your social media or your email or however you want people to reach out to you? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Dirk, D-I-R-K, at 
prisonscholars.org. So that's P R I S O N S C H O L A R S.org. Most of our social media handles Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, that's at Prison Scholars. Or, you know, you can just Google Dirk Van Velzen. So that's D I R K V A N V E L Z E N. Or just Google Prison Scholar Fund. I'm pretty findable. Yes. Dirk, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. And thanks for the drinks, too. Those yes, are great. Yes. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day. <laughs>